This episode of the Majority Report is brought to you by SunsetLakeCBD.com. SunsetLakeCBD.com is our favorite place to get CBD. It's the only place I've had uh, any um, that I've, I've found CBD to be effective, frankly. Uh, they were a farm. Uh, they are a farm outside of Burlington, Vermont. They used to provide uh, exclusively, uh, or I should say on this farm, they would provide dairy for Ben and Jerry's. And then around 2018, they decided to diversify. They've been growing uh, hemp now for two years, three years, I guess, two years. And they have been doing it with, um, with uh, great business practices, $15 minimum wage. Majority of their company is employee owned. Uh, and with the help of our listeners, they've grown from 10 people in 2019, or less, I should say, to now more than 20 people in 2020. They're paying uh, for uh, agriculture and manufacturing jobs in rural Vermont. They have some new strains that they're uh, introducing in mid-November, and including like the, the flower, the smalls, which is Matt's favorite, and the keef, uh, sour special sauce. Special seven, super sour space candy. I don't know what the differences are. Uh, maybe Matt does, but uh, you, Matt will get a sample. He'll tell us about it. But one of the things that they're doing is they're practicing regenerative farming with the help of University of Vermont. And their CBD is completely pesticide free. But it doesn't mean that they don't have a way of killing pests. They use integrated pest management. It's a system based upon the advice that they got from University of Vermont Extension School. And their IPM involves purchasing the eggs of parasitic wasps and predatory assassin bugs. Apparently the eggs are overnighted to them. They come on these small sheets of paper. They place them throughout the field to hatch. And once they're mature, the bugs will prey upon unwanted pests that they have. Um, Folks at home who garden might be aware of things like the corn borer or aphids. I certainly know spider mites. I'm not sure what those are. Leaf hoppers. Uh, and so instead of spraying these, um, these pests with chemical pesticides, they just uh, create basically an ecology that reduces the pressure of, of these insects on the hemp. And so they make, um, they make gummy bears with CBD, tincture, which is my go-to to get to sleep every night. They also have uh, smokables. They have CBD infused coffee. That is my weekend drink. Matt's a huge fan of their smokables. Uh, and then uh, one of my favorites is the Arnica and CBD beeswax rub that has been uh, gotten. I've given it as a gift to friends and they love it for their muscle aches and and so we've gotten emails about it for arthritis. Uh, check it out today, sunsetlakecbd.com. Use the coupon code left is best and get 20% off. Left is best. They're fans of the show. They want to use that one. So it's 20% off. Left is best, sunsetlakecbd.com. Let's start the show. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. Ah, ha, ha. If I get the feeling you've been cheated... It is Tuesday, October 27th, 2020. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps and steps and steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Matthew Hongold's Hetling, journalist and author of A Libertarian Walks Into a Bear, the utopian plot to liberate an American town. Before then, Ari Melber, writer from Mother Jones. Berman. How the, excuse me? Ari Berman. Ari Berman. Oh, gosh. Ari Berman. 
uh, writer from uh, Mother Jones on how this 6-3 court could decide the election. Also on the program today, oh, Amy Coney Barrett confirmed and sworn in the first Supreme Court justice to receive no support outside her party in nearly 100 years. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court quashes state courts ruling on allowing for counting absentee ballots after the election in Wisconsin. Hospitals across the nation report a flood of COVID-19 patients. An increase in COVID deaths are almost sure to follow. New polls show California's Prop 22 with a slight edge. Tell your folks, your friends, your folks, vote no. Meanwhile, polls show an increasingly low marks for the federal response to the coronavirus. Speaking of which, the Trump administration blocking food aid for low-income Americans. Philadelphia sees protests in the police killing of William Wallace. Joe Biden is laying low as Bloomberg dumps 15 million in Texas and Ohio. Mississippi is sending the Supreme Court a ban on abortion after 15 weeks. That could be the first big test for Amy Coney Barrett. And the Congressional Progressive Caucus gears up to get real. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Uh, Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, We are uh, breaking format today because we just got so much news to get to. Uh, Last night in the, um, uh, quite late, Amy Coney Barrett uh, was sworn in as Supreme Court Justice right after she was uh, confirmed by a uh, uh, Senate with absolutely no... um, Democratic votes and having lost uh, both independents and the uh, one Democrat, excuse me, one Republican, uh, Susan Collins uh, from Maine in her uh, day late, day short, uh, dollar short tour. Uh, So let's bring on uh, the writer uh, from Mother Jones, Ari Berman, who is um, who is uh, written the um, the essential book on uh, voting rights um, uh, back in the day. A lot of things have changed since uh, that that book came out, uh, Ari. Uh, welcome to the show. Hey, Sam. Good to see you. And new and improved, Sam Cedar 2.0. Why? You just say, oh, because I don't have my beard now? Because I can actually see you when we're talking. Oh, that's right. Yes. We've yeah. upgraded uh, slightly around these parts. All right. So, Ari, you've been uh, pretty busy, uh, obviously, Having uh, uh, written uh, the book, uh, Give Us the Ballot, The Modern Struggle for Voting Rights in America. But you wrote that, uh, what was that now, like four years ago? 2015, five, so 2015, five years ago. Five years ago. Um, it's time for a sequel. <laughs> and uh, it feels like every other week you could write a sequel because we are slowly seeing the diminishment of uh, voting rights in this country at the hands of the Supreme Court. And what happened last night, there was actually two things that are gonna have a dramatic input, uh, impact on voting rights in this country. And maybe as early as eight days from now, uh, uh, a week from now, obviously is election day. Um, why don't we start with what happened with the Wisconsin ruling? Because not only, it, it's not just the ruling, it is what how Kavanaugh and Gorsuch wrote about that ruling that may have, uh, there may be some tea leaves there for you to read. Yeah. So it was crazy, Sam. I mean, I was watching senators vote on Amy Coney Barrett, either Mitch McConnell was finishing up his remarks or senators were voting. And suddenly this voting decision from Wisconsin comes in and the Supreme court rules five to three that voters have to return their ballots by election day. They can't be postmarked by election day, which is what a lower court ruled. They have to be returned by election day. Now, this was not in and of itself that surprising because the Supreme Court has basically ruled this um, in every single case. However, this time they actually wrote opinions saying why they did it. And some of those opinions were like, whoa, oh my God, what is happening here? And really it was Brett Kavanaugh that had- Before we get to the opinions, 
Now I know, and I've read um, multiple writers on this who have said it's not that surprising that they have changed it. But we are one week out, and the Wisconsin, um, the the Wisconsin State Election Board or whatever it is, says that you can get your ballot, you can get your absentee ballot by 5 p.m. Not today, but 5 p.m. on Thursday. Yeah, there you can request by then. There is no way in by mail you can request. There is no way, particularly with the way that the post office has been uh, uh, manipulated this year, but really in any context, that you can get that ballot and mail it back and be assured that it's going to arrive by Tuesday. It's just not physically possible. And my understanding from my uh, brief time as a law school dropout is that if I, uh, you know, offer you a uh, an opportunity to accept an, an offer that I'm making to you by mail, then whatever, as soon as you put that in the box, the, the deal is done. It, I don't have to wait to get it. I've told you to do it by mail. I mean, that's what, that's what there are theoretically could be tens of thousands, five, you know, maybe just thousands, maybe, maybe a hundred thousand uh, voters in Wisconsin who relied on that from the lower court and from the, uh, the, 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 the voting board or whatever it is, and they're going to get screwed. And we got to remember, Wisconsin was decided by, what was it, uh, 20,000 votes in 2016? Yeah, Wisconsin was decided by 23,000 votes in 2016. And during the primary in April, when the Supreme Court said that actually voters would have more time to return their ballots in a pandemic, that as long as your ballot was postmarked by election day, it could be received up to six days after, 80,000 votes were counted during that period of time that would have otherwise been thrown out. And so the question is, if voters request these ballots um, by October 29th, I hope they realize you need to drop these ballots off in person or you need to go vote in person. We can complain all we want about the Supreme Court decision. And I right. totally agree with you. It's crazy. It's insane. We're past the point of complaining at this point. I think people should, first off, I don't think you should request a mail ballot in Wisconsin anymore. I think unless you are physically unable to get to the polls, I would say go vote early in person or go vote on election day uh, in person. And also remember, if you're not registered to vote, Wisconsin has election day registration at the polls. So if somehow you didn't register, you can also register and vote on election day. But yeah, it's crazy. We've become numb to this, Sam. We've become numb to just assuming every single time the Supreme Court's going to do the wrong thing, because that's basically what happens. But this decision was so shocking because of what Brett Kavanaugh said in his opinion. That's what really took it to the next level. We expected a bad decision, but we didn't expect quite so psychotic opinions, particularly from Kavanaugh, who's now the quote unquote swing justice on the court. Okay, so he writes in his concurrence uh, um, to the decision of this um, a uh, and and I've seen I mean, I've there's a lot of like legal types of people right now who are who whose hair is on fire at what he wrote there. And um, it 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 comports also with 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 some that that Gorsuch has has written, which is which is what to explain it to us. Well, people's hair are really on fire for two reasons with Kavanaugh. Um, Number one, he basically said we need to have ballots arrive by election day because we need to be able to declare the winner of the election on election day, which everyone but Donald Trump knows is not going to happen. And then Kavanaugh said, we don't want to have a situation where mail ballots could flip the outcome of the election which is the exact same thing that Donald Trump tweeted last night at the exact same time this opinion came out. Donald Trump said, we need a winner on November 3rd. Well, we're not going to have a winner on November 3rd, most likely. If we do have a winner, it's going to be Joe Biden, not Donald Trump. But we're not likely to have a winner. So Kavanaugh is basically pumping out Trump disinformation about mail ballots uh, in an opinion. Then he, he cites Bush versus Gore. And that's what also really put people's hair on fire. Because he said state legislatures, they override state courts. And this is really, really important because there is litigation, for example, in Pennsylvania, where state courts have made it easier to vote, but Republicans want to override those decisions. And so people are really concerned that the court is preparing to override state courts that have done good things on voting rights in places like Pennsylvania and North Carolina. But more importantly, Kavanaugh, 
Amy Coney Barrett, John Roberts, they all worked on Bush versus Gore in 2000 for George W. Bush. So there's, a, there's already a precedent for them intervening on behalf of a Republican in the Supreme Court deciding the election. So the minute Kavanaugh says Bush versus Gore, you're like, uh-oh, is this the master plan here? Is, is he admitting that this is what their plan is? Because that's not what Donald Trump is saying. But now it seems like we actually have a justice on the Supreme Court that's saying the exact same thing. All right. So let me just go back here. Uh, the, the, in terms of hair on fire for reason number one, the concept, and this is what he wrote, those states, speaking of uh, the states, those states want to avoid the chaos and suspicions of impropriety that can ensue if thousands of absentee ballots flow in after Election Day. Now, let's be clear. Millions flow into California. Millions. After Election Day. Uh, thousands of absentee ballots flow in after Election Day. And we should also say it's not a question of like them flowing in. We know how many went out. We know what the lid is on how many they're going to come in. Right. If there's only been a one point four million ballots sent out in Wisconsin and a million are in, then we know that the most that can come in are four hundred thousand. Right. So it's not like it's willy nilly. But he says in after Election Day and potentially flip the results of an election. I want people to understand this. You cannot flip the results of the election if the, all the ballots haven't been counted. That is the functional equivalent of me saying, hey, we're going to count my ballot, Sam Cedar's ballot, and anything else that comes in after that is going to possibly flip the election. No, the election is the totality of the legal ballots. It is not a subset of those. And so you, by using this term flip, because I just want to make it clear that you're not paraphrasing here. You are quoting. He is saying flip the results of the election. These are not the results. The non-absentee ballots are not the results of the election. And when he says this, he's indicating that he believes they are. Exactly. And, so- and, that, and that's what Elena Kagan said in her dissent to him. You're not flipping the votes. Those are the votes. This is how votes are being cast this year. And increasingly, these are how votes will be cast in general, which is that we have two ways of voting in this country, voting in person, voting by mail. They are different ways of voting, but they are still votes. They count equally. There's no difference in in the process. And Kavanaugh raising some idea that there's improprieties because mail votes are going to come in and be counted is so shocking that you just wonder, are they going to try to invalidate any mail votes? Are they just going to well, basically say, we are now going to do whatever we can to invalidate mail voting because we believe there are suspicions of improprieties here, even though you have red states like Utah voting by mail, you have blue states like Oregon voting by mail, you have the military voting by mail for decades, you had okay. Republicans in Florida 2000, including Brett Kavanaugh saying, count all the military ballots that arrived after election day. So this is a very, very scary argument that I'm really worried now could get five votes. I do not believe Chief Justice John Roberts would sign on to this in a Bush for v. Gore 2.0 scenario, but John Roberts is irrelevant now. He's irrelevant. So the question is, can you get Alito, Thomas, Gorsuch, Calvin, and Amy Coney Barrett. And that's a very worrisome lineup right there. All right. And so just to be clear, uh, Kavanaugh is stating that the concept of ballots that don't aren't counted on Election Day are dubious at best. And then he is, on the other hand, saying, OK, the way that we interfere in this is by saying that we don't believe that the state Supreme Court is a valid arbiter of what state uh, law means in the context of elections. In fact, we are the arbiter, the federal Supreme Court, which is, I mean, you know, in 2000, I think Ari, you and I have talked about this. I was obsessed about that count to the point of, I have, I, I, I made a ill-fated, uh, you know, uh, low-budget film about it. I I I took um, thousands of photographs of my television uh, during the count, and it took me um, it took me a long time to get over how shocked the legal profession was that the the federal Supreme Court even took that case, yeah. and now they are building on the taking of that case to the point of saying like, not only was it not controversial that they took that case. The federal Supreme Court is obligated to shut down any state courts that go against the will 
of how we narrowly define the lawmaking capacity in these states. And to be clear, they also say, and why is that? Because the voters have the opportunity to hold those lawmakers to account. But in fact, go look at Wisconsin, the state that they were ruling on, and you have Democrats getting 56% of the vote or 54% of the vote in, in 2018 and Republicans holding 63% of the seats. There is no accountability there. I mean, this is just, it is, this is a, this is, this is, this is rigged. This is what we say. This is a rigging. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's, what's so incredible about this decision. Cause remember, go back to the gerrymandering decision. The Supreme court came out with last year. They said, you can't challenge gerrymandered maps in federal courts. You can only challenge them in state courts. So what do voting rights groups start doing? They start challenging gerrymandered maps and other voting laws in state courts because they believe the federal courts will not hear these cases anymore. Then the Supreme Court says, no, you actually can't challenge these things in the state courts. You have to defer to these insanely gerrymandered state legislatures that have no accountability whatsoever to the people. And not only that, those same state legislatures are saying, we're not going to give you any time to count votes early. So we're going to create a situation like Trump and Kavanaugh want, where there's uncertainty over the counting of the ballots. So Republicans are manufacturing a crisis by not allowing votes to be counted early in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, which everyone should realize. Then those same Republicans are going to capitalize on that uncertainty when it takes a few days to count the mail ballots. Say, see, this is why nobody should have voted by mail. This is why we shouldn't count those mail ballots. And so it's so obvious what's going on here. I just hope that the media, Democrats, et cetera, are prepared to expose this when votes actually start getting counted and the incredible hypocrisy becomes evident because they're going to say, if Trump is ahead, like you said, once the vote comes in for Sam Cedar, that's it. They're going to say, no, no votes after that should count. Right, and we have to be prepared to push back on that very aggressively. That is illegal, what they're saying, but they're going to make it seem like it is. And they're going to try to get crazy justice on the Supreme Court to rubber stamp these illegal theories. Yes. Well, I mean, that's that's how we go from things that are illegal to being legal and the law being um, uh, really reduced to anything, anything le- um, to nothing more than just a brand, essentially. And, and, and so to be clear, the scenario that we're concerned about here is you get um, 100,000 ballots that come in. We've already, they have already effectively, at least in Wisconsin, shut down the ability of me to get my ballot by, by mail, like, uh, like uh, Wisconsin says, and to get it in postmarked. I drop it off at the post office on, no- on November uh, 2nd, uh, on Tuesday, and, or I drop it off on the post office on Monday or I drop it off on the post office on Saturday and it doesn't arrive until Wednesday, forget it. That ballot does not count anymore in Wisconsin. So yes. people got to go vote. But the scenario now that this opens up is the ballots come in, they're in an envelope. They arrive on, uh, on Tuesday, but there's so many of them that uh, the, the board of elections says, okay, we've got 300,000 ballots here or 50,000 ballots for that matter, on a race that, that could be come down to 5,000 votes, that's a big deal. Uh, it's going to take us three days to count them. And then all of a sudden the Republicans sue, they go to state court, it bumps up, to, they go immediately to Supreme Court because now we know the state court has no uh, say in this. And the Supreme Court says, you got to stop counting. You got to stop counting. We've already said that this could flip the the results. You got to stop counting. So they could stop counting in Pennsylvania or in Wisconsin or any other state with bags full of of tens, hundreds, thousands, tens, thousands of votes just sitting there that were cast legally. So I I don't think that that's actually going to happen in the case of Wisconsin, because I think if those ballots arrive by election day, and it takes a few days to count them, there is no law in which they can try to throw those ballots out. So I'm not as worried about that scenario. Here's a scenario I am worried about in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania has given voters three days extra uh, to be able to have their ballots come in. So if they're postmarked by election day, they can be counted up until Friday. The Supreme Court deadlocked four to four on that case and declined to overrule 
the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, but it was not an actual ruling. It was just a deadlock. They couldn't do anything about it. So now Pennsylvania Republicans have tried to challenge that again with Amy Coney Barrett on the court, to try to get that extension knocked out. Even if they don't challenge it before the election, they could challenge it after the election. And they could say, these ballots that arrived three days after, these should all not be counted. And that to me is what Kavanaugh is referring to. I don't think Kavanaugh would have any legal standing to say ballots that arrive by election day should be thrown out because he just said you have to have them in by election day. But he could say, I was never on board with this extension of ballots in Pennsylvania. It was never constitutional. We never actually ruled on it. We just deadlocked. And therefore, we are now going to look at this. And in fact, the Trump campaign is asking that these ballots that arrive late be, quote unquote, segregated so that you actually know these are the ballots that came three days later so they can challenge it. So let's say 50,000 ballots come in in Pennsylvania, and that's the margin of victory. That's the scenario I'm worried about. I think that's the thing that Brett Kavanaugh is laying the groundwork to try to challenge. Well, um, Ari Berman, um, Mother Jones, we will, I imagine, be talking to you uh, more over the coming weeks. Hopefully not, not about, I hope I don't have the opportunity to say like, yeah, you nailed it, Ari. Maybe uh, how about like maybe the coming day or like uh, days? Let's, we'll, let's, yes, let's we will there. see. Uh, appreciate uh, your time today, Ari. Great to see you as always. Thanks. All, right. All right, folks, uh, we're going to take uh, just a quick break here. Um, but also uh, we're going to be later in the week uh, talking to some people as to, you know, how to prepare yourself for a situation like that. It's very frustrating to be sitting here and saying like, well, I'm not a, a lawyer who can go argue this case anywhere. Uh, what can I do as a citizen? We will, we will have a guest on uh, to talk about that later in the week. In the meantime, uh, a couple words from our sponsors. As you know, uh, obviously, routines are a little mixed up right now. Um, you're a little anxious about stuff. Uh, you, maybe you want to pick up some new skills. You want to learn something. Uh, the way that I have been um, picking up, well, for me, one of the reasons why I use Blinkist is because there's a lot of stuff out there I just don't have the time to read. Or frankly, sometimes it's not the inclination, but I do feel like there's probably some takeaways from it that I'm interested in. Well, this is what I use Blinkist for. It is a, a unique and powerful app. It works on your phone. It works on your tablet. works on your computer. And you can um, listen or read the key insights from over 3,000 non, uh, nonfiction bestsellers in over 27 categories, they condense them down into what they call blinks. Like I say, they're 15 minutes worth of reading or listening to. And now Blinkist offers its members exclusive original podcasts that come from top authors and creative thinkers. You can also dive deeper into full-length nonfiction audiobooks at a special discounted price. That's for Matt. Over 14 million people use Blinkist and they deepen their knowledge of topics spanning from self-improvement, management, happiness, and more. I've told you guys in the past, uh, for me, one of the things that I, uh, that I took a, a lot from was uh, like the uh, Tim Ferriss's four day work week. Uh, and, but I, don't know, I was like, I'm not gonna read the whole thing. I'm going to actually uh, take his own advice before he does. And I just get the key takeaways from stuff like that. So you can use it when you're working out, when you're walking to, uh, maybe you're, you're maybe you're walking more with your commuting or even if you're in your car. 15 minutes, you can get the key takeaways of, of how-to books, how to make your life better, how to meet friends, <laughs> it's everything. Uh, but also um, some really also solid nonfiction stuff. Uh, for instance, they have, uh, they have uh, 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 Rachel Maddow's Blowout get the key takeaways of, of, of that or well, American carnage on the front lines of the Republican civil war and the rise of president Trump. I don't know if I want to read the whole thing, but I'm curious as to what the key points of it were. There's also a book that I'm interested in. Everything is effed a book about hope. I could use that right now. Right now, Blinkist has a special offer for just our audience. You go to Blinkist.com slash majority report. Start your seven-day free trial, get 25% off a Blinkist premium membership and up to 65% off of audiobooks, yours to keep forever. Matt, that's for you. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash Majority Report to get 25% off a premium membership and a seven-day free trial. 
Blinkist.com slash Majority Report. Also, uh, one of the things I've been doing during this uh, era of COVID, well, we actually started before it, but it's been, uh, it's actually had more, um, you know, my social life, I'm not going to kid you folks, is not exactly what it used to be. Even when it was something, it wasn't anything, frankly. But um, right now, very difficult to have a date night with someone, uh, someone special, or uh, in my instance, it's a way that uh, I entertain my kid. She's a teen, not the, not the younger one. Hunt a killer. It's a murder mystery subscription box. And it really is one of the most exciting ways you can spend a night at home. Hunt a killer is, um, it's, it's, it's an ongoing murder mystery. It's sort of almost like a, like a serialized season of, of your, your favorite mystery show, except for here's the difference. You are the detective. They send you a delivery and then you sift through like documents, evidence, audio recordings on like thumb drives, case files, pictures. Uh, what you do is you eliminate suspects, you identify murder weapons, you crack, you crack the case, you catch the killer. You learn the backstories of all the suspects, their complicated relationships to the victim. You watch as the story unfolds. If you can't bear to wait for a month for the box to come, you can hit that expedite button. Uh, Mile and I have a couple of boxes backed up. That makes it much easier for us. Right now, we're in this. Uh, I'm not going to do a spoiler alert here. I'm going to be careful, but it's basically a, a cold case from the Depression era that a theater owner has found this stuff. And so it's actually been fun insofar as like you look at this stuff and it all, you know, they've done a very good job graphically of making it look like this is all evidence from the 1930s. And because I am an incredibly pedantic person when I get around my kids, it's also an opportunity for me to go off on all sorts of tangents about that era. But it's also super fun. My daughter loves this stuff. Um, so you're cracking the case. And in this instance, uh, learn a little bit about history as much as she tells me like, please, can we just get back to what we're doing here? Right now, just for our listeners, you can go to huntakiller.com slash majority and use the promo code majority at checkout for 20% off your first box. Head to huntakiller.com slash majority, 20% off. Show your support for our podcast. Give yourself something special to do during this time. That's huntakiller.com slash majority. All right. And just a reminder, uh, this program relies on your support. You can become a member by going to jointhemajorityreport.com and get extra content every single day. Um, Okay. I'd like to welcome uh, to the program, Matt Hongolt Hetling. He is a uh, journalist from Vermont and has written uh, a book that uh, is... um, really very much up my alley. Uh, a libertarian walks into a bear, the utopian plot to liberate an American town and some bears. Uh, Matt, you there? I am I think- here. I can't believe I'm on the majority report. How are you doing, Sam? I'm doing well, Matthew. You got to turn your, uh, your, your, you got a lot of light behind you and we can't, we, you, you're, you're, you're a very mysterious right. apparition unless you're trying to do, are you in yeah, I am that, not. I know. Let me let me try that. There we go. That's much better. Great. Thank you very much for that. It looked like you were yeah. in the witness protection the program. Just came out from behind a cloud. All right. Well, terrific. Well, listen. <laughs> this is uh, an amazing That's story. Fun, uh, as if heralding your approach. Yes. Well, uh, this is this is an amazing story. To give us. This takes place in Grafton, New Hampshire. New Hampshire. Um, I. I, I think I may have brushed up against this at one point, um, having been a guest on a, on a radio program out of New Hampshire called Free Talk Live, which, um, which I think some of these guys, they would talk about like- I, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I sort of followed what they were saying. I mean, uh, in that they were trying to create a, a libertarian state in New Hampshire. And I wasn't quite sure how the rubber met the road. And he, here, th- this is a story of how the rubber met the road and how the rubber found that the road had massive, massive potholes when it was basically incapable of driving on because of, of the nature of libertarianism. Uh, tell us, how did you get interested in this story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, th- thanks for asking. I, I had a little bit of a hiccup there with my connection, um, but basically uh, I was, 
asked to go to this town to talk to a woman for a totally unrelated topic. Uh, she uh, had a bunch of cats. So I was kind of like chit chatting with her about her cats. And she said, oh yeah, I used to let them outside, but that was before the bears came. And I was like, oh. Yep, we seem to have, are you there? Sorry, we lost you, Matt. S Sam, I'm sorry, do, do I still have you? Yeah, we're, we're still here. I'm sorry, Sam. Uh, my, uh, looks like my connection's uh, being a little fussy. Um, but so, so, uh, so basically, the, the, so the woman said that we have a, before the bears project. came. Yeah. Right, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was like, oh my God, well, that's, uh, that is the craziest uh, arrangement of words uh, that, that I've heard in quite some time. Uh, please, please tell me what that means. Uh, and she explained to me that uh, the bears in her neighborhood and in the town of Grafton had become unusually bold and aggressive and were exhibiting all sorts of like, kind of like bizarre non-bear-like behavior, including attacking the cats of homeowners in the area. Uh, and so I kind of started asking questions to figure out what was going on with that. And that is what led me to ask uh, or to learn about the free. Oh gosh, we, uh, we're having a little bit more problems with that. Yeah, so maybe do we just want to try uh, audio and uh, maybe uh, let's, let's just video. try some audio, uh, uh, Matt, maybe we, you can shut down your camera for us. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Uh, hopefully, hopefully that resolves yep. it. Can you still hear me, Sam? Yeah, we can. So, um, so you started to hear about this this notion okay, of of a, a a free New Hampshire, essentially. That's right. That's right. Uh, and and before the Free State Project, there was the Free Town Project, where it was basically like all these libertarians uh, from around the country decided that. Uh, shoot. Okay, we're gonna have to um, we're, uh, we're gonna have to get back to Matt at another time. Um, uh, folks, we're gonna take just a uh, two minute break. We'll be right back after this.
Okay, folks, we're having a little bit of technical difficulty, so we will get to uh, Matthew Hongold's Hetling uh, on another day. Meanwhile, uh, we're talking a little bit more. Excuse me. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that, folks. We had a little bit of technical difficulties. Uh, we will get to uh, uh, Matthew uh, Hongold's Hetling on another day. That story of a town in New Hampshire it was overrun by libertarians um, is uh, in many respects a, um, a sad uh, metaphor for what's happening with uh, coronavirus in this country. We will get to that in a moment. Uh, but staying on this, uh, the story of Amy Coney Barrett, who uh, last night was not only confirmed, uh, but also sworn in as a Supreme Court Justice, the fifth woman uh, on the uh, court in the history of the court, um, the first justice to receive absolutely no support from the opposition party, I believe in, in at least 100 years. Um, so a highly polarized pick. There is, um, well, let's go and see what uh, Mitch McConnell says about Amy Coney Barrett. Um, she understands or I should say he understands uh, the value of Amy Coney Barrett to uh, the Republican movement. But let's play this clip because I, I have an alternate uh, theory as to uh, why Mitch McConnell was so desperate to do this. Do you think this will potentially cost you Senate seats? A number of Republicans are in tough reelection battles. We know that this seat uh, belongs to a liberal icon. Justice Ginsburg was much beloved. Um, she was a cult, pop culture phenomenon in recent years as well. They yeah. seemed very fired up about sort of avenging the loss of this seat by showing up at the polls and voting for Biden. Well, if you recall, we had a Supreme Court fight a month before the election in 2018, and we actually gained seats. Uh, I think this. Uh, uh, nominee will be a political asset uh, for our candidates around the country, not a liability, but an asset. Now, I don't think Mitch McConnell believes that. I don't think he, um, I think he believes that uh, what's happening with these races is essentially baked into the cake at this point, particularly in the Senate side. Um, it's unclear to me that uh, the Brett Kavanaugh hearings helped the Republicans in 2018. It was the greatest victory for Democrats in an off-year election in decades upon decades, not in terms of seats, but in terms of votes, because of course we have a tremendous amount of gerrymandering. And certainly this um, set of hearings did in any way provide nearly any of the uh, drama that the Kavanaugh hearings did. But Mitch McConnell is concerned about one thing at this point and one thing only, and that is his legacy of having fundamentally altered the federal judiciary, both on the appellate level and the Supreme Court level, for decades. He's managed to place over 200, close to 220 federal judges lifetime appointments on these uh, appellate courts and on the, the federal court system in general. And we are going to be living with the consequences of this. I mean, frankly, these consequences will exist probably beyond my lifetime. I'm, 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 I'm hoping to hang in there but I'm not sure I'll be too aware of what's going on at that point when uh, the, the justices and the judges that have been placed in the courts and the Republicans were, uh, were very methodical in putting people who are young on the court, who will be there for decades, decades. Uh, Mitch McConnell has bragged about keeping that Merrick Garland seat open so that he could fill it and drive voters to the polls because he understood the importance of it in many respects. I mean, I would imagine he would like another four years to completely own the judiciary, but uh, Donald Trump has put more judges on the bench uh, than in four year period than I think uh, has maybe happened ever. Certainly in the modern era to have three Supreme court justices 
picks and to have over 200 federal lifetime appointments is extraordinary. And we've talked about the reasons why that has happened, but that is Mitch McConnell's legacy. Here is a, um, a clip of Mitch McConnell talking to the Republicans during the Amy Coney Barrett vote, which I think indicates what he, why he sees this as important. Something to really be proud of and to feel good about. We made an important contribution to the future of this country. A lot of what we've done over the last four years will be undone sooner or later by the next election. They won't be able to do much about this for a long time to come. Fortunately for Judge Barrett and for our nation, history will remember what is already clear. The deficiency. So there it is. I mean, on some level, um, there's a certain amount of projection here, or I should say, uh, this is a, maybe what we would call a humble brag. Mitch McConnell is telling uh, his fellow senators to feel proud about what they're accomplishing because it is going to fundamentally alter American society in a way that legislation can't because legislation can be reversed. This is going to be a bulwark in McConnell's mind against any progressive change in the country. That's what he is hoping is going to happen here. And he very well may be right. He very well may be right. We will be talking uh, over, uh, I would imagine, the days and the weeks and the months to come about the push and the pressure on Democrats to expand the Supreme Court and perhaps to, to expand uh, parts of the appellate court. The Supreme Court has nine justices because at the time it was uh, configured, there were nine circuits. There are now 13 circuits, essentially. Federal court silos, if you will, dealing with either uh, regions or specific federal questions. It would make sense that there are that many Supreme Court justices. This is only, there's only a statute. It's just law passed by the House, passed by the Senate, signed by the president that configure the number of justices. Now, you may not hear that uh, from on uh, some cable pundits, for instance, um, Tucker Carlson. Here is Tucker Carlson's uh, guest. Uh, her name is uh, Jenna Ellis. She is a uh, Trump campaign legal advisor and a, um, uh, a I guess, a, a supposed constitutional law uh, expert. Where is this all going? Jenna Ellis is a constitutional attorney. She is a campaign advisor, a senior advisor to the Trump reelect, and she joins us tonight. Jenna, thanks so much for coming on. Great to so see you, give us your most sober analysis of where you think this is really going. Well, of course, Joe Biden and the rest of the Democrats simply want to change the rules. And they don't care about the Constitution. They don't care about our system of government. They would prefer to keep the judicial branch as a super legislature and as an activist majority. And that's what we've seen through the past 50 and 60 years. What um, She is a, um, a supposed constitutional expert, uh, I guess, in some ways. She... Um, she wrote the legal basis for a moral constitution, a guide for Christians uh, to understand America's constitutional uh, crisis. But as she said, these are uh, they don't want to follow the rules. Um, the Republicans have established the marker that rules are just rules and they can be changed. Constitution. Um, theoretically cannot be changed, according to uh, conservatives. But uh, rules are just rules. Laws can be reversed, as Mitch McConnell just said in his speech about uh, the value of them placing 
all these justices on uh, or these justices on the Supreme Court and judges on the federal uh, court. But rules can be changed. Well, if rules can be changed for Republicans by Republicans, then rules can also be changed uh, for Democrats by Democrats. And so once you cross that Rubicon, once you say that the Senate is not going to be constrained by the way that it's been functioning in the past, because one party has decided that we're going to take advantage of this, um, then it's incumbent upon the other parties to follow suit. There are, you know, constitutional parameters about the legislature, but beyond that, then it just becomes a series of rules and laws. And until both parties sit down and can agree to uh, rules and laws, you don't, you, you, you have instability, but you need both parties to do it. And one party has been now for at least a decade, maybe you might argue more, has been, has basically taken themselves out of that agreement. The agreement no longer exists. There is no longer a meeting of minds about this. So the idea that uh, Democrats would expand the court in light of, of what the Republicans have done, particularly in the, in the Garland uh, situation, um, and the intense obstruction by Mitch McConnell the idea that Patrick Leahy would observe blue slips, which was a Senate tradition. If one of the senators from the home state of a federal judge nominee did not want that nominee to get confirmed, then they would withhold their blue slip and the chairman of the judiciary would prevent that nominee from getting a vote. It's a it's a it's a fairly uh, anti-democratic um, institution. It's one that Patrick Leahy adhered to with a almost a religious fervor, even more extremely than um, than most judiciary chair people in the past. And it's one that. Uh, Grassley and Graham completely threw out. They ignored it as Republicans. And so that is why there was no ability for Democratic senators to stop judges like the Republicans had. But it was just a rule and it was thrown to the aside, thrown aside without I don't know. I mean, how many people out there even heard of this? How many of your average people, even people who follow politics, even heard about this dynamic? Very few. So the Republicans got away with it. Um, here is the Amy Coney Barrett ceremony, the swearing in, if you will, um, the Trump campaign immediately turned it into a campaign ad, like within, I don't know, moments where they, were they actually, uh, they were, maybe they were doing live cutting as they were uh, watching this. Here it is. This is from last night at the white house. On this October evening, the first lady and I welcome you to the white house to bear witness to history. In a few moments, we will proudly swear in the newest member of the United States Supreme Court, Justice Amy Coney Barrett. She is one of our nation's most brilliant legal scholars, and she will make an outstanding justice on the highest court in our land. The American people have been profoundly impressed to learn of her achievements, her compassion, her generosity, her faith, and her sterling character. Justice Barrett, made clear she will issue rulings based solely upon a faithful reading of the law and the Constitution as written. 
not legislate from the bench. Justice Barrett, as you take your oath tonight, the legacy of our ancestors falls to you. The American people put their trust in you and their faith in you as you take up the task of defending our laws, our Constitution, and this country that we all love. Wow. I'm struck by, um, I mean, they, they, they wanted this ad, obviously. You can see the, uh, the way they shot it. I mean, this was all about the, the advertisement they were going to cut. Unfortunately, their, uh, their narrator was, seemed to be exhausted. Matt, Brenda, you, could you imagine something less inspiring than the way that uh, Donald Trump was reading uh, that teleprompter? Well, yeah, my work here is done. I mean, it feels like, why do we need to vote for you if you've already gave us this, Donald? Like- I'm not quite sure this dynamic works. We know that almost a quarter of Republican voters in 2016 voted because of that empty Supreme Court seat. I mean, I think it's one of the most underreported and underattributed reasons uh, given in the myriad reasons that Hillary Clinton uh, lost that election. But it, it, it was significant. It is hard to say that you create that type of urgency when you say, we got 6-3 now, and you're just going to sit back and watch the cascading of of precedent, essentially. Like if he loses, it's because people are tired of winning. Exactly. Well, he how quickly like can they? Too. How quickly can they turn that this victory into fear of court packing on the part of the Democrats? That that I think is exactly it. I think the conservatives they are motivated by aggrievement and the potential for aggrievement. And so I think that's what the attempt is going to be. And that is why I think, you know, um, one of the reasons, I don't know what uh, Joe Biden's, how open he is to expanding the court, uh, but one of the reasons why he has been very reluctant to take a position on it, I think, is for that, to not give conservatives a toehold. Now, with that said, according to Ryan Grimm at The Intercept, more than 20 New York progressive elected officials are now calling on Chuck Schumer to commit to expanding the Supreme Court. And when we spoke to uh, Brian Fallon the other day uh, from Demand Justice, who was a former Schumer staffer, he talked about how Chuck Schumer is doing a lot to develop relationships with progressive groups national progressive groups that are based in New York, uh, some obviously local progressive groups in New York State, but those national uh, progressive groups that are based in New York, Chuck Schumer is doing that to cover his left flank from a primary. And people know this. They are pressuring him to not just come out as an individual senator, which would be sufficient if he was an individual senator, but he is the leader of the Democrats in the Senate. And in the event that the Democrats take the Senate a week from now, then any subsequent days it takes to count the rest of the ballots or are allowed to, uh, there is going to be growing pressure on Chuck Schumer to actually take a leadership role in this uh, attempt to expand the Supreme Court we're going to be talking more about this in the um, in the coming days and weeks, obviously. Uh, but and as we said uh, with um, with Ari Berman, that the um, the danger is, of course, and the, one of the reasons why Donald Trump, at least publicly stated, he wanted Amy Coney Barrett on that bench prior to the election was so that she could rule on any election-related materials. And uh, certainly the ruling that we saw regarding Wisconsin last night gives people a lot of pause. 
We're going to take a uh, quick break. and We'll be back with more after this. We're back. Um, obviously, uh, the White House the other day uh, signaled that it was no longer in the controlling pandemic game. Uh, it's more or less. I think it's not terribly surprising. It's unclear to me that they were ever in that controlling pandemic game. They sort of moved from denying its existence to claiming they were uh, going to do something then sort of jumping over the do something to claiming they had done something. And now uh, they are in full blown, we don't really need to do anything mode. We've heard that uh, on multiple occasions now from Mark Meadows, the chief of sta staff for uh, Donald Trump. Um, he, uh, and, and the results are starting to kick in wherever the country is beginning to turn cold. You are starting to see, particularly in the um, Midwest, in the upper Midwest, in the Mountain West, and in the south, Southwest, apparently also in Appalachia, Washington Post reports that they are seeing record levels of patients suffering from COVID-19. More than 42,000 people were hospitalized nationally with the virus on Monday. That is steadily climbing toward the midsummer peak caused by massive outbreaks in the Sun Belt. And we are sure to see soon, when you see, this is the way that it goes. You see an increase in infections, and then lagging behind that is an increase in hospitalizations. And then lagging behind that is an increase in deaths. El Paso reached 100% hospital capacity on Sunday and starting to set up field hospitals to uh, handle the overflow of patients. We've seen uh, field hospitals set up in Wisconsin as well. State officials have dispatched 100 nurses and five doctors to the hospital to help, uh, but the hospital has asked for 45 more nurses. This is the University Medical Center in Texas. 41 states in Puerto Rico have more hospitalized COVID-19 patients now than they did at the end of September, and 22 of those states have seen increases in excess of 50%. We are going to see in some places rationing of ICUs. And when we get into flu season, hopefully flu season will, will be somewhat diminished, I guess, from all the social distancing that people are hopefully doing and mask wearing to the extent that they are in certain places. But the problem is our hospital system is built to deal with an influx of flu patients every year. But our hospital systems are not built to deal with an influx of flu patients and COVID-19 patients. Top trending places with the most cases per 100,000 residents in the last seven days, North Dakota, South Dakota, Wisconsin, Montana, Wyoming, Indiana, Utah, Arkansas, Idaho, excuse me, not Indiana. That's uh, according to the New York Times. In Michigan, hospitalizations have jumped 80% in just the past few weeks. We're seeing uh, new reports that uh, around 40 degrees, the air gets uh, significantly drier and the ability of the virus to stay in the air increases which is why you're starting to see more and more um, recommendations 
for the use of humidifiers, particularly in colder areas. The humidity apparently um, makes the air a little bit thicker, ends up uh, dropping some of the uh, virus to the ground quicker. And so um, this is uh, what we're looking at. And we're looking at a federal government that has all but given up in trying to diminish the number of, of infections. The World Health Organization on Monday sent out a blanket uh, warning, don't give up on efforts to control the pandemic. I think that's what we call a subtweet, right? They don't want to name uh, the US, but that's, uh, that's the case. Like I said earlier, Axios has a uh, Ipsos poll that shows that um, 62% of people find the federal government is making the country's recovery worse. So uh, Americans are paying attention to this and we will, we will see if they do something about it at their, um, during their elections. Um, one other thing I wanna get out there uh, there was this uh, story going around. Apparently, um, the Today Show played this clip, and it needs a, a correction. I imagine they have uh, issued a correction by now, but it needs a correction because you folks are going to run into it. There was a, a clip of Joe Biden that was taken by uh, Trump. Here's Donald Trump saying, uh, you know, uh, characterizing this clip. This is clip number seven. Ask me a question like that. What flavor do you have, sir? Uh, I have, he wasn't actually sure, actually. I have vanilla and chocolate. I said, they never asked me a question like that. Even crazy 60 Minutes, you see it last night? She was so hostile to me. And with him, it was softball. But you know what he did uh, yesterday? He, he called me, you know, he called me George yesterday. He didn't remember my name. I'm insulted by it. I, I didn't know. Was I supposed to be happy or was I supposed to be sad? He called me George. And then I hear the reporter sort of said, no, 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 it's not George. Donald. We can't have this. Look, our country is too important. President Xi is 100% sharp. Putin, 100% sharp. Kim Jong-un, North Korea, 100% sharp. We can't have this. This is not a game we're playing. If Biden. So uh, Trump's going back to the Sleepy Joe thing. Um, he's also lying that the reporter said uh, it's uh, Trump because it turns out, even though it's been cut uh, to make it look like Biden forgot his name, the name that Biden was, I think, searching for. I mean, I think that Biden has forgotten the name of George Lopez, who was one of a couple of people who was asking him questions on a, a, a Biden camp, a Biden campaign event. Here's that. Um, here's the, the actual clip. Um, well, yeah, we have time. Let's play the Today Show version. This is the, the this was played on the Today Show, but it was given it to them by the Trump campaign. Got to be careful. When Biden you get these things. headlines overnight after a. Biden making headlines overnight after appearing to confuse his opponent's name. Four more years of George, uh, George, uh, he uh, is going to find ourselves in a position where if uh, Trump gets elected, uh, we're going to be uh, we're going to be in a different world. It comes right. as the pa former pause that now let's play the actual clip. Hey, so so, you know, that over 50 million people have already voted, which I think is inspiring yeah. for the country. You know, Joe, there's going to be eight days left. They want me to ask you, and I want to know, like, if someone is undecided or maybe maybe thinking about not voting, why should they vote and why should they vote for you? Well, uh, first of all, the reason they should vote is that there's a lot on the, on the ballot this year. I mean, this is the most consequential, not because I'm running, but because who I'm running against. This is the most consequential election uh, in, a, in a long, long, long time. And the character of the country, in my view, is literally on the ballot. What kind of country we're going to be? Four more years of George, uh, George, uh, he uh, is going to find ourselves in a position where if uh, Trump gets elected, uh, we're going to be uh, we're going to be in a different world. 
All right. Well, there you have it. He's talking to George Lopez. I think he couldn't remember his name. He's probably done a ton of campaign events just like that. All right, folks. Uh, we'll talk more about this tomorrow. And for those of you sticking around for the fun half, appreciate your staying with us. As you know, we uh, wrap up the show in an hour uh, now because we stream tape delayed on um, on the Peacock app, which you can find. Uh, it's the NBC Peacock app, and you get a search either for the majority report on that app or you could find the choice and find us at five and then we run again at eight and then i think at 11 i don't know i think it keeps going that way i think throughout the day i'm not 100 percent sure uh but you can find us there and there's, there's different graphics same show different graphics and today of course we had a little technical difficulty with that stuff um just a reminder ultimately uh while we are hopefully getting a little bit of new audience going over to the uh, Peacock uh, place. And, and more importantly, in my mind, reaching a type of, 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 I guess, person who has interest in politics. What would you call someone like that? What would you call like, like, like people who watch political news? But I think, that, I mean, those people are probably... Um, I wouldn't say that they're ideologically to the right. I just think that they're they're they they're the the politics that they're following are just not quite as in depth as as we like to go around here. Is that infotainment exactly? infotainment watchers? Yeah, I mean we're yeah, I mean we're, we're infotainment too, but I guess we we're just trying to do like a little bit more info. Yeah. Can you Policy imagine tainment. us? Can you imagine people watching us in like a dentist waiting room? I mean I like what the you, idea what you, of it. What are you suggesting? What are you I just think it's a bit, I think we just have a bit more of maybe a, you got in some like ways cool casual, dentist. in some ways engaged, but a different type of vibe going. We have a different type of vibe, but it's also, you know, uh, trying to give people a little bit longer uh, notion of the import of what they're watching is not just, not just e totally in the moment. If you were to watch that interview with Ari Berman today after watching the majority report for a year, you could track all the different reasons why we've arrived at this point to this point. Whereas I feel like on a regular cable news show, everything comes at you with the from the woods, basically. There's not that long running uh, you know, trail behind you. That I hope. I hope you're right about that, Brendan. I mean, the idea is that that, you know, when we do have uh, Berman on, that there is a context and that when we start talking about, uh, you know, particularly things around the court and legal issues and stuff like that, there is a sort of foundation that people have. Um, and that's that we try and build. That's that's I, that's a good. But we just need a word for it. We have any German listeners who have like a word for that or something. I'm sure we do. Um, we very well. We very well may. Uh, just a reminder, it's your support that makes this show possible. You can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. Also, check out the AM Quickie. It's getting out the door very, very early in the morning. Even on days when we have hiccups, it's getting out the door super early. Uh, so check that out. Six or seven minutes every, every uh, morning in your uh, podcast machine, or, uh, or you can see it on YouTube at uh, Majority Report Audio. And uh, don't forget, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY, get 10% off. And today at 3 p.m., the Nomi Key Show. You can check it out at youtube.com slash the Nomi Key Show. Uh, and in fact, with us right now is Nomi Key. She can oh. tell us uh, about who's going to be on the show today. Hi, Nomi. Hi. How you doing? Great I'm job. Thank you. Thank Two you. stars, three stars. How many stars are you supposed to give somebody? It's the G-N-O-M-E thing. He's working for me. I don't <laughs> I know why. People doing the gnome. Oh, my gosh. And the, the, they have like the memes on. Oh, my. It's hysterical. It's yeah, very it's creative awesome. audience. Thank yeah, you for very, the yeah. sounds like a t-shirt that should be probably be made for boom. Merch. Yes. I love it. I'm oh, always God. for it. Okay. We need like a really great design and then we'll push it out there. And of course we will 
uh, will pay whoever designs it, like AOC would when when that came up. I don't know why that was controversial. Anyways, what, are, what what's the show about today? Um, we have uh, actually friend of this universe, Joshua Khan Russell's on to talk about uh, the pending coup, potential pending coup, and what we can do. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the ridiculousness of the media over the last few days and in um, in handling this election with Matt Bender and Napoleon de Legend. That's today. But can I do a little promotion? I have something else I want to promote. It's it's a it's an amazing sure. thing. All right. So you guys know I'm part of this organization called Matriarch, and we have a summit. Uh, this Friday is a virtual summit, and it's being headlined by the one and only Cory Bush, Jane McAlevey, Nabila Islam, uh, Francesca Fiorentini, Tara Hauska, Javanka Buckles, Barbara Smith, who coined wow. the term intersectionalism, uh, also Nobel Peace Prize uh, nominee you know, a few decades ago. So this is... Uh, it's going to be an amazing summit. More guests coming. Uh, we have a few congresswomen that are going to be joining us. We just can't confirm. We just can't say it yet. Um, so it's going to be an amazing summit. You want to go check that out. It's uh, There's tickets. I have to promote this properly. It's bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash, slash matriarch summit, M-T-R-C-H-S-M-T. I've tweeted it out. So if you want to go check it out there, um, all virtual, 27 bucks a ticket. Send it to Brenda. We'll put it in the uh, links uh, of uh, the show today. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. All right, folks. Also, uh, don't forget to check out The Antifada. You can find it at patreon.com slash The Antifada. And Matt, what is happening on TMBS tonight? Uh, yeah, Megan Day is going to be on talking about rural America and healthcare and uh, life after Bernie. Also, Ryan Pollock going to be on to talk about eco socialist rank and file strategy and building left power in Texas. And also, a pre recorded interview with Eric Osgood. All that tonight uh, at the Michael Brooks Show YouTube page and patreon.com slash TMBS. All right, folks, we're going to take a quick break, head into the fun half. Um, Nomi and I are going to talk about this piece. Where the heck is it? In the intercept about the CPC. Mm. They're finally uh, deciding to actually become real. Maybe, maybe, maybe. <laughs> I'll hold back. We're going to take a quick break. See you in the fun half. Cool. Left is best. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> Some good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, uh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight, fifty-six, twenty-seven, one half, five, eight, three point nine billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd. Don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of stealing vitriol and hatred, you left-wing Limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Rand Paul. I had my first post-coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. <laughs> What you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agree. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. 
Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the fun half of the show. Forgive me. My daughter is, of course, unaware that I uh, work ever so i have to uh make sure she's doing okay um no me uh where do you, where should we start today um the we may very well have a uh, you're talking to joshua con russell on, on your program about this we may have him on thursday for a couple of minutes too to just like get the word out this is it's a very frustrating scary feeling isn't it mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's that. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I mean, I've started to meditate a little bit more lately. Because um, <laughs> if I don't, I just start screaming at people like my parents basically. Have said. <laughs> oh, we're not supposed to do that? <laughs> well, it's natural in a Greek home, but uh, definitely feeling it internally. Um, I mean, I don't know. I, like, wh what? To, I'll know more today after talking to Joshua, but they, he is, and, and it's actually very concerning that the entire strategy of the Republican Party right now is just basically voter suppression. Like, Donald Trump is just doubling down on closing any alliances he could potentially make. It's like, he's not spending any time expanding the electorate when the electorate is turning out in such record, record numbers uh, for who knows which side at this point, because there's really no clear indication, a little bit, but not too much. Right. So Well, it's well to be fair... They have they have over the past four years, anyways, registered more Republicans in a lot exactly. of these keys in these swing states. Now, not I'm not talking like hundreds of thousands more, but tens of thousands of more. And um, these are states where tens of thousands of votes made the difference in 2016. So there has been, in many ways, a re an expansion of the electorate on the on the Republican side. Um. But they're you know. fighting a generational. I mean, you, you yes. and I both have talked about this. They have to to survive, um, you know, and, and and I think, you know, it's probably going to be too much for them to handle. And I, I, that's why this is a scary moment, because when they can't win electorally, when they can't win, when they fix every single, you know, they, they, they put every fix in and they have voter suppression, they're going to resort to violence on the streets. We've seen it before. They're winning they're losing the argument they're they're losing the narrative they're losing the leadership republicans trust me i think marco rubio you know they're gonna say we denounce the violence on the street but of course they're happy i i am less concerned about the violence on the street uh, at least you know in and of itself or, or, let me put it this way as a catalyst i mean what i am concerned about is what we talked about with uh with, with ari berman yeah. that the supreme court makes the decision in two key mm -hmm. states to limit the number of ballots that are counted um, and 20, 30, 50, 75, 100, 120,000 ballots right. sit in bags unopened, maybe 40,000, whatever it is. And we never know who they voted for, but we can surmise what the likely breakdown is based upon the breakdown of who requested ballots and who right. returned ballots, you know, and it's going to be, uh, there's, there's going to be some Democrats who vote for Republicans. There's going to be some more Republicans who vote for Democrats in this, in this round, uh, particularly, you know, uh, and, and they, but they sit there in their bags. They're not counted. And uh, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and maybe other States, um, they end up, uh, being called for Trump. And then the question is like, what happens then? Right. Right. I mean, that, that is the scenario. Like what, like what do, I mean, do we see the, I don't know, millions that went out in the women's March? 
did those people uh, come out in addition to all the people who have come out for the Black Lives Matters marches? Uh, I mean, do, like, like, is there a mass mobilization that happens at that point? And how long does it last? But of I mean, course. of course, of course. Yes. I mean, listen, I understand that the, the, the 2000 is like burned into our memories, but of course. And st- how I mean, long... don't the numbers right now show you in terms of, of, of voting, like, like just what's going on in America? I mean, this isn't like five times. In a, this is 10, 20 times the turnout in historic elections in many states right now. That's crazy. This well, is a... we don't know if how much of that is is increased turnout versus a redistribution of how people are voting. In other words, whether it's a temporal redistribution, like, okay, I always vote on election day, but this year I'm voting early. But they can tell based on like demographics, for instance, like 18 to 29, there's that whole thing that's going out where we know exactly how many people 18 to 29 voted in 2016 in key swing states. And on the count right now, it's already 10 times that number. Right. I mean, so, yes, there's indication that that people are more invested in this. And I just I I wonder, though, like, you know, and this is we're in uncharted territory. But, you know, I guess I still remember like the protests against the Iraq war. And and uh, George Bush was just like, I'm not I'm not going to focus group this. Well, I mean, uh, it's a pretty big focus group uh, that you're talking about. Um, But I mean, how many days? How many days? Like, I mean, like how sustained? um, does it have to be how sustained can it be and what and then and what's the recourse i mean you know like we don't have in the event i mean i guess the only precedent is 2000 frankly and i remember that and i was so distraught at the lack of 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 dissent and the lack, to the extent that there was dissent, the lack of coverage of it. There were protesters at George Bush's inauguration. That was sort of like unheard of up to that point. And nobody knew it because they were corralled behind uh, like the, the parade line uh, bleachers. And mm-hmm. no, none, of the, none of the networks would move their cameras over there. Um, and I, I, you know... I, we're living in a t- completely different era, yeah. but what we're what we need is that much more. I think, you know, we in other words, we have no precedent for this. We have no precedent to like like and what's supposed to be the outcome of that. So imagine we don't know the number, or the number is uh, uh, the vote is is contested to inauguration day. Then what? Then well, what? If the vote is contested to the inauguration day, to the extent that it can be contested, because I think that's the whole point is the Supreme Court will use that deadline to shut it all down and say, we've got to come with a resolution. Right. Because on inauguration day, Donald Trump doesn't just get to keep serving as president if there is not a new president. Exactly. He stops serving as president. And And then what? Then it's, well. Nancy Pelosi? (laughs) It's Nancy Pelosi assuming the hilarity of all this, the long game, guys. This is what it was always about. <laughs> I don't think the Supreme Court uh, or Shaw and Boot- No, no, it's not Shawhead, but yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Hakeem Jeffries or Steny Hoyer, I guess. Oh, right? God, I mean, I don't know. President Steny um, Hoyer. But, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I like. I don't. I think the Supreme Court would shut it down there. But I'm just saying, like, what if they did? What if they wrap that up? Like, I mean, are, are, do people have the are there enough of these people who are willing to say because ultimately there's only really one power right that people have and it's not just a question of going into the streets um that's almost like a metaphor what it really is is withholding their labor yeah they don't have to go into the streets to withhold their labor they can hold a sign out their house and say like i'm not going into work and i'm not working and um in some respects it's um, that has to be across, it seems to me, has to be a trans, I don't know, how do you say this, uh, trans class, um, you know, it's not going to be, you're going to need the, um, you're going to need all the people doing the essential work yes. in our country, so-called essential work, 
Uh, you're going to need uh, all sorts of labor and and workers, but you're also going to need some of the those PMCs uh, to also withhold their labor. And um, as a way of basically, you know, when the Fortune 500 companies start to feel it, that's when you start to see some, you know, some action or when. Uh, yes. But I imagine that there are like, you know, it's not hard for me to imagine that the flight attendants go like, hey, guess what? We're not flying. Uh, and I mean, it, it, obviously, there's some essential workers in the middle of a pandemic that I can understand, like nurses saying, Let them. of course, okay. of course. Um, but I mean, this is there is a strike school that uh, Jane McAlevey and Sarah Nelson organized an international strike school. It took place about an hour or an hour, uh, a month ago. I think it was a month ago. Um, and they focused very much on this. It's not getting a lot of attention, but people are organizing. People are thinking about it. They're very it's a very realistic conversation about a general strike. It's not something that just the left is shouting online anymore. Um, and I think like what you're saying, this is the only way in the middle of a pandemic, after we have taken to the streets, we've had the largest, first it was a women's march in 2020, uh, in 2017. And then obviously the uprisings of 2020. And it still has not influenced even democratic lawmakers. Right. So at what point does, does, does like, you need the movement in the streets, you need to withhold labor, and you need strong leadership standing up. And I do think at least this time around versus 2000, 2000 you have Democrats who are willing to say, now, no. And, and I mean, even Chuck Schumer, like, I, I will give him a little credit. The last few days, he's, he's strengthened his voice, but a little bit, a little bit late, buddy. Yeah, I mean, it, it it would be a fascinating turn of events if we had a basically a general strike in this country that was uh, not founded in a I mean, certainly the labor movement would be in, in the vanguard of this. Right. Because they are organized for this and they there is a an awareness um, and an education and, and a pre-existing sort of like predisposition to this. Uh, but I would imagine a general strike in this manner would be, at the very least, there would be, it would be across class concerns, right? Because this is yeah. the, 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 in, in, and, um, so the and streets to what having solidarity with the workers, essentially, you know, yes. the, the pussy and I don't hats think there would the... even be, I mean, look, I just don't think there's a, a high degree of class consciousness across the, across the country. I just, I think that, that is, I think that. I, I mean, I just think that is not the way that broadly speaking, there's certainly more than there was, uh, you know, 20 years ago in, in right. my estimation uh, and certainly less than there was, but certainly less than there was, let's say a hundred years ago mm -hmm. uh, in this country. And, um, and I think the, the ultimate irony could be that a general strike that is at least on some level untethered, from a class consciousness uh, because it's really more a, I don't even know if you could call it an ideological strike at that point, but to some extent, yes, because, you know, Donald Trump is just so off-putting. Uh, you know, it's really more of a strike that is, that is, that is, that would be in this instance uh, about, you know, democracy Yes. On some level. And so so in other words, you have labor and then and then they're influencing just to spell it out very clearly for folks. Other folks are motivated to do the same exact thing, even if in solidarity with with the labor movement that they may not be a part of. So it transcends just a labor strike. Well, we, we have to have it, uh, you know, outside of the labor movement because it's simply just not enough. Not big enough. Uh, well, but but it know, is actually. 7, it is. Yes. I mean, that's true. I mean, it is big enough, uh, frankly. Uh, you could shut it down, but there would be uh, they, they would be the vanguard. And um, and then and then people would fall in behind that That's because right. I believe the strike would be perceived less about um, about, let's say, labor issues That's right. and more about democracy. And the irony of of all that would be then you are introducing a whole generation of people to the power of withholding their labor. And what might start as something that is uh, devoid of class consciousness could ultimately lead to a much higher level of consciousness about class and about the power of people uh, uh, that, that people have a lot more power in the context of uh, whether they decide to deploy or not deploy their labor at any given point. Um, 
And, we'll and see. you know, I mean, this, gosh, oh, man, the summit that we're doing, this matriarch summit, it, it's so interesting that you bring this up because that's the theme of the summit. It's, you know, we wanted to do something around class and feminism, but really, like, what is the roadmap? Because so many of these essential workers in these unions were majority led, led female led unions and majority made up of females. And we know that women of color, black women in particular, are on the front lines of this pandemic right now and have been put into horrific circumstances, completely unprotected for months and months and months. And that conversation has really kind of been left out, you know, in a mainstream way. So that's one of the goals we, we have with the summit is to talk about what do we do um, starting today? Because, you know, don't wait until January 20th. Don't wait until right. after Election Day. Start today. Right. People need to be aware and, and start to build expectations for what's going to happen. Worst case scenario in, in regard to that is that, you know, Joe Biden wins Florida by four points on uh, on Election Day and boom, we're done. And uh, and everybody goes, Whew. brunch. Right. <laughs> right. Of course, that, that actually is the worst case scenario. Everybody's like, OK, we're done. See you again in four years, everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm terrified of that as well, frankly. Um, let's so but let's let's get to. Um, Let's get to uh, let's get to some of that. Um, uh, there, there are two things that, that just popped up on my radar. <clears throat> One is, uh, well, this this notion of uh, the intercept piece. Mm -hmm. When um, when AOC came on the program, I can't remember when it was over the summer, mm -hmm. maybe in June. Um, she brought up the fact. It was the first time I've heard a politician um, acknowledge that the Congressional Progressive Caucus is um, not a terribly exclusive club. Uh, they don't. <laughs> it, it, it is. Um, it, 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 and it's sort of fascinating because uh, back 15 years ago, yeah. the idea was, well, I, I can actually describe it to this. I can do it analogous to this. Um, my daughter, uh, we, we, I had her taking tests. The, the, they do the, in New York City, they do the gifted and talented tests. Mm -hmm. And um, I had her taking tests because they were low stakes in my mind. Like, I didn't mm -hmm. care. And I was like, you're going to have to learn to do tests. Let's go take tests. And so she did really well uh, at one point on one of these. And it gave her the opportunity to go and maybe get into NEST, which is like, Every, it's highly coveted uh, public school in the city because you go you go from you go from uh, sorry about is that, that your ringtone yeah that is my ringtone how did I not uh, know you go from you go from kindergarten all the way through high school right. and one of the horrible things about New York City schooling is like each each time you jump up you have to go through a whole process and it's a very highly coveted. And but there was another school like that that was on the upper. Way up in the Upper East Side, and this one's down the Lower East Side, mm -hmm. and you got to go for an orientation. And at the nest thing, you go and you wait in line. There was a line around the block. You get into the uh, the the uh, uh, the auditorium and it's jam packed. And I sat in there like I took like two or three hours to do this. I'm sitting there and like 25 minutes into their presentation, they announced like. There's two spots for second graders or something, and uh, they're probably going to go to kids who have uh, siblings. And I'm like, Jesus, like you had to come down siblings? there with documents. Yeah, because they, they, they allow they're siblings like to go in. Yeah. They give them priority to go to school with the same kids, which makes sense. I mean, that way the parents can drop off both kids at the same time. And I'm just like, oh, my God. And I walk out and I, you know, you had to bring all these documents and this and that. I went to the one up in the Upper East Side. Similar dynamic, at least in terms of, I think it was K through eight, maybe not all the way through high school, but it, it, it catered to kids living uh, in, um, not necessarily in, in, in uh, poverty, but lower income families. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was like a, a dress code. And uh, so I go to the, um, to the orientation. I got like all my documents and I'm gonna hand it out. And I, I walk up to the desk and I give them to them. They're like, we don't need to see that. And I'm like, you don't? Because I had gone through such a rigorous thing. And they're like, no, you wouldn't have showed up if uh, you weren't eligible. Why would you do that? Wow. And, and I walk in and there's like 25 people there. 
And sort of the progressive caucus used to be like that. You, there was a liability that was perceived to call yourself progressive. So why would you join the progressive thing if you weren't progressive? Right. And as the value of being a progressive increases, uh, increased, yeah. you're getting more people who are like, oh, all I got to do is raise, you know, cut you a check for four grand. That's I'll take that branding for four grand. That's Here's right. my check. And you had people who were literally like met blue dogs. They weren't officially blue dogs, although I think you could be, uh, who would just be like, I'm a blue dog, but I'm also in the progressive caucus. <laughs> and cause I pay my, my dues. And that's been a problem because you got a group of people who are supposedly the progressive caucus. And if they can't move as one, doesn't matter how many people are in it. If they don't function as one and they fall apart and they're working across purposes, then the cohesion of that group falls apart. And when AOC came on, she said, she, she was the first person I've heard who is a politician who's part of that caucus who pointed that out and said, well, that's a, that's a problem we need to deal with. And also, it sounds like they're starting to do deal with as, it. As you just said, it also disrupts their ability to have solidarity of the caucus, which makes them more powerful. So not only are these people able to get the branding, but it, it's actually like busting up the caucus. Um, but, you know, I, I'm going to take it it's a little bit different, but but similar point. I also think it's, an, you know, you, there's this point where you, in order to build your branding, in order to build the value of a caucus or a politician's power, you build these alliances with folks and you bring them in. It's why, like, sometimes you look at Bernie's endorsements and I'm like, that person's not that progressive. What are you doing? Like, but he need, he needed to build out his branding and his support across the board, across the country, in key demographics. But then there's a point <laughs> where you don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> Right, and, where it becomes counterproductive. Exactly. And what, where is that point? I don't know. I, I, I hope that the CPC, especially after this election, um, is there. You know, and the other thing is, like, they don't even really necessarily need a huge caucus, although it's fantastic if they do. They just need to have it large enough to disrupt and push their agenda uh, internally. I mean, you know, you people can look at this in terms of phases, right? Like, you give me a small, very dense piece of lead... <laughs> Uh, that can be more powerful than, you know, a uh, a big, big, fluffy uh, pillow, <laughs> right? I mean, it's like, it's it, honestly, well, but that's the point, right? No, like right. that the, if they can move, if they can move, if they get 10, 20, 30, 40 people instead of like, what is it now? 90, 100, uh, uh, close to that. Mm -hmm. They get 40 people or even 25 people who vote as a block. That's right. You get me you get 24 other votes because we're all on the exact same page. That becomes a very, very powerful tool because, you know, you're going to need to get, you're going to need them. I don't know what numbers people are anticipating in the house, but it's hard for me to believe that there's going to be a democratic majority that is going to be significantly that can afford to lose, let's say 25 or 40 votes. Uh, and, that I mean, that's how the Freedom Caucus. Yes. Um, you know, they did. It was a two part uh, prong. They would in and, and, and the Freedom right. Caucus. Nobody even knew how many people were in it. Yeah, it was confusing. The Some of them with... didn't ident identify as yep. it. Um, does that affect their ability to get key positions on committees and leadership? So well, how do you disrupt that? That obviously is um, where the real power lies. But I think you need to get enough people that you can sway or reasonably be considered to sway a leadership vote. That's what it comes down to, right? Like, yeah. are you going to, I mean, this is the one area where things become a little bit more analogous to a parliamentarian system mm -hmm. a parliamentary system. I should say, yeah. if you can create factions within the context of the democratic caucus, um, that's when things that's, you know, that's what I I'm quite convinced. That's what Pelosi, <clears throat> it, it, the reason why she has been so firm on the stimulus, mm. even though there would be benefit to people. Mm. And, and, and I want to be clear here. I am not defending her. This is in my estimation, a bit I'm of an tell. indictment, yeah. um, that 
there is in that stimulus, it is not nearly sufficient in size. It is not sufficiently targeted <clears throat> in terms of what Mnuchin's offering. We don't even know exactly what the details are, but we know there's some stuff in there, right? Like we know that there's a, a check to people. We know that there's an expansion of unemployment insurance. There's not probably cities and states and this and that. Um, it's unclear to me that that's ever going to, you're ever going to get that unless you have either a Trump win and a, or, I mean, like, like you're like, not going to get it. You're not going to get what you, what the Democrats want Democrats unless want Biden right win and, and the Democrats win the house and the Senate. Right. And you're not going to get anything, you know, until after the election, that's the choice. And so you go for what you can get. But the reason why she won't do that is because she doesn't want to sign on to something that leaves um, her committee people in the lurch. They're heads of the committees. Who and are beholden to certain interests. Exactly. Right. And so aren't their members of those committees beholden to certain interests, and they want to be able to deliver that. And they're not nefarious interests, necessarily. They could because be. they're put on those committees because of these interests. Exactly. Right. And Or because they've cultivated these interests because they're right. on these committees. I mean, however that worked. Mm -hmm. But, like, if I'm on the, uh, I don't know, Health and Human I mean, Services, I may have hospitals that I, you know, that that in my network of support is built through these networks of hospitals. If I'm on the education committee, it may be through teachers unions, et cetera, et cetera. I've got to deliver, or I've got to have a good reason why I didn't deliver. Because if, if other people get stuff and I don't get it, then I'm like, whoa, whoa. You know, my supporters are like, you're the wrong person to be here theoretically. And so, uh, Pelosi says, like, oh, nobody's going to get it because of the Republicans. And then the committee chairs are all safe. And if the committee chairs are safe, then Pelosi is safe. Exactly. Because they're the ones who also the ones have like little fiefdoms That's right. and little their own little coalitions within the 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 caucus. Uh, and uh, that's the that's the politics that's going on here. She's and she's an amalgamation of these committees. Like like there's like a piece of her that is this committee, that committee, this, and, and as long as all these committees are protected by her, because that's so much of what this is about, is protection, too, both ways, then she's safe. So I have a question for you. In in 2000, was it 17, when uh, Tim Ryan uh, launched his, how was he able to pull so many votes with well, this dynamic he, in play? Did how he? many did he end up getting? At, he got, I mean, a, a, a chunk, right? I think there were some who were probably released on some level. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Did, did, did he really get that many votes? It I can't seemed to remember. me to be over before it there? even began. I mean, no, I, I know say, he didn't have a chance, but at that it time, was... at that time, I was um, against his candidacy, or yeah. I should say, like I was supportive of Pelosi um, because I didn't think that he w had the ability to do the job. I thought she was going to be better at it, but I got to say, in retrospect, I would prefer, and and again, to be fair to myself, this is before 2018. So mm -hmm. there was no, there was no squad. There right. was no effective pushback whatsoever. Like I feel like in a, I don't think they're quite there yet, but in a, in a legitimate challenge to Pelosi, like, look, I would rather have somebody whose ideology I clearly did not agree with. Mm -hmm. Like a Tim Ryan. Like, I think that I have some ideological issues with him. Um, Absolutely. Who is inept. <laughs> then somebody who is supposedly aligned with my ideological, but is adept. Except because they, Justice Democrats, one of the cases that they, and I, I maybe this still would have happened. We can't really, you know, entertain it, but she is a great enemy and that mobilizes folks to support these candidates to disrupt. But if, if Tim Ryan were there and he appeared to be, you know, he would be like the Obama of, of, of oh, Congress. I, know. Right? I don't think I would be, I think he would be even more, he would appear even more of the enemy as it was from an ideological standpoint. And he just wouldn't have control over the caucus that a Pelosi does. Now, of course, this is sort of a little bit like, you know, if I had wings, I'd be flying type of situation. Mm -hmm. If he had more, if if he if he had more control of the caucus, he would have won, <laughs> and he would have been able to do it. And and had he won, he would have been able. But but I don't know. Um, so who's who would be a good progressive um, 
well, that's, that would have that's, that ability. That's part of the problem. Is that I don't know exactly. that we're there yet. I don't know that we're here there, there yet. I don't know that anybody's developed that type of, of, of strength yet. You know what I mean? I don't know. Poke I don't him? know. But I, I, but no. my point is, is that I would rather in the absence of someone who could be a strong progressive leader, a, a speaker of the house, I'd be willing to take a weak non-progressive leader. Right. Because yes. that's, that is, you know, there's some advantage to having a weak leader if you are an insurgents, uh, insurgents in the caucus. Yes, that's the argument about Biden, guys. That is yes. it. Well, I mean, we'll see. Uh, meanwhile, speaking of Biden and this other uh, fight that's going on is, you know, and I don't think we've talked since that report about jo- uh, about Bernie wanting to be <gasps> labor secretary. I have so many comments about this. Ready for when? it. Wait, <laughs> okay. Begin- Please. I just did an, I did an interview over the weekend with Harvey K, uh, where we talked for about, we were just chatting about it, and they're like, well, let's, let's do an interview. So it's on patreon.com um, slash the Nomi Key Show. It's really good, because he brings in a historic context to this. Listen, we're just talking about the leadership makeup of Congress, and, and the Senate is even worse. Why would, I mean, Robert Reich notably talked about he was being caged in when he was Labor Secretary under Clinton. You want to get rid of the most powerful voice, progressive voice in the world who is who can be political. Like he has a campaign account in which he can send out emails on behalf of candidates. He can uh, put out media that is political, not out of his that's not out of his Senate office. He can have his Senate role inside and he can have his political role outside continuing that because he has this. He's built a, a, a massive movement, obviously. You put him in the labor secretary role. That's all gone. Not only is his voice in the Senate at a time when we really need to have bold, progressive initiatives and voices leading the charge, because we know nobody else is going to pick up where he left off. Elizabeth Warren might a little bit, but I don't know. Why on earth would you put him in? in, in and not only that, most labor leaders don't like Bernie. There are a few, but most of them don't have a great relationship with him. So just think about, I just think it's a horrible move. There are plenty of people who would be extraordinary labor secretaries. You know, really, there are. But Bernie Sanders removing him from the Senate, when we just start to build power and we actually can push the Biden administration and we can push Schumer, and he has this massive online, uh, he's educating people through his videos still on, on the political side. I just don't see it. I think it's a horrible move. And if you look back at history and listen to Harvey K, he agrees. I, I would, I don't know if I agree. Um, okay. Only because I would imagine that if he does go into labor as labor secretary, there would be, he would do so under certain like terms right now. Maybe he's not in a position to get those terms and maybe he doesn't do it. Uh, but I keep thinking about Francis Perkins and sure. now granted the relationship between FDR and Francis Perkins was different. FDR exactly. pulled her in and this and that. And I agree in terms of Robert Reich, but one of the reasons why it was easy to cage in Robert Reich is because who's Robert Reich. Right. Like, like, I mean, when he comes in as labor secretary, who's Robert Reich. One of the reasons why it would be difficult to cage in uh, Bernie Sanders is because everybody knows Bernie Sanders. And that, you know, his ability to be the um, a name in that position, I don't know. There's there's and we should also say, listen, just before any, you know, we go any further, we should also say that um, Scott in um, uh, Governor Scott, is it in uh, in Vermont has pledged to appoint a independent Democratic caucusing replacement for uh, him in Vermont. So we don't lose that Senate seat as it was. Um, I guess the real question is, is to what extent can, uh, you know, what can Sanders do there? I mean, I think from, I I don't know, this is complete uh, conjecture on my part that building the labor movement, he thinks is something very focused and something that he could do and help in that, uh, in that regard there. And to do that, that it's like one of those things where if you build a labor movement, you strengthen labor in this country, that becomes he's in some level. It's like he's the I think the idea is he's going in and um, and building the tool. Right. Like one of the things that you learn when you start to do uh, 
amateur hack uh, woodworking is that <laughs> building jigs is like the most important thing you can do. Like the, the, where, where you build essentially tools to build the stuff that you're building. <laughs> and, um, and you know, when you figure that out, all of a sudden how to make everything easier to make, um, I think that's, I think that's the theory behind it. I don't know. It sort of really depends on what the deal is, right? Like what his portfolio is, the resources that you have might be pretty big there. I don't know. I mean, he may have a sense, like if he was labor secretary, he could do X, Y, or Z, which he thinks would have more impact than just being a voice because, you know, He's done that voice. I don't know. But he's not just a voice. This is a voice now that has a movement behind him. He's, he's, you know, even just the function of his list in fundraising for candidates gets candidates elected. Like when he endorses somebody, it helps get candidates elected. And we are on the precipice of actually- Can he not do that as labor secretary? He can't as labor secretary. Why? The You're hatch act? off limits. You can't do- Well, come on. We're not the Trump administration, hopefully. I mean, but, uh... you know, of all people to violate that, it's not Bernie Sanders. He can't do political work. And I just think, you know, it's such a huge bet. This, the neoliberals have proven to the Bernie movement, to Bernie himself, that they are not honest in their negotiations. Yeah. So why would he put his entire career at a moment where he's done so much work, inspiring others to run, getting folks elected, educating a generation, uh, going around the country doing rallies, you know, nonstop. That's stuff he loves to do, to cage him in well, into but it's also an like, administrative it's not... role. I mean, he knows what he's, you know, I mean, like, he, he... does he? I, I mean, I, I'm not like, I really, sometimes he cuts these deals with people. Sorry, Bernie. And I just say, where, where's the politics Wait, do here? Do you think he's not interested in doing it? I mean, if, I don't know if that, that story is true or not, but it's not. It's Politico, like, so I don't really, the person who yeah, wrote I mean, it is maybe not the most it's not honest a true story. But I, I, yeah. I got to think if he wants to do it, he knows what he's doing. Uh, but let's take a phone call first, shall we? There's also a story about their floating uh, Gina Raimondo. Uh, as Treasury Secretary, but I think it's like one of those things where we're going to uh, offer you the worst possible person so you accept somebody who is subpar. A little bit, yeah. Call him from a 215 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hi, Sam. Hi, Nomi. How are you? Hello. Hello. Hi. Mindy. Mindy. Sam, I got to tell you, hi. my area is really turning. But I'm. It's something uh. going on in Bucks County. I don't know oh. what it is, but traditionally, um, the houses that seemed like they used to be Trump supporters now have signs on their lawns that say Biden and then support the Northampton police, which is a big stretch. <laughs> Interesting. Plus, <laughs> why, hey. why are you laughing at me? Well, I'm mean, laughing because it's a, it's a stretch. Wait, they're the same house? Yeah, they the same house. That's has, amazing. Um, Support the support the police, which is traditionally a Republican house, right? And they're Biden signs. Hey, like next to each other, they're not even on opposite ends of the lawn. They're like next to each other. Um, but there's a lot of that. It's not like it's in one or two houses. It's like it's in a lot of houses. And the girl behind me, the the Trump supporter that's running for the um, legislative position, the state rep, she won't put any. Trump signs out on her lawn. She's got nothing. And they're like bombing her, like on TV, like her and Brian Fitzpatrick. I, I think they're going to flip the Brian Fitzpatrick seat. I don't know. It's going to be tough. But you drive around here and all the big Trump signs that they put. Remember I sent you that one, Sam, where they had the big red circle with the line in it? It's all over the township. Like they're, they took all the signs and they spray painted it. And the one that I sent you was really faint because they were trying to rub it off because they didn't have more signs to put out. I got to say though, Mindy, you know, I know, I know now you may be right, but I just remember uh, back during the uh, Republican primaries in 2008, my neighbor uh, was a Ron Paulite and they would go out and do these <laughs> paint the town Ron nights and I went into his wood shop and he had like 400 Ron Paul, handmade Ron Paul signs that they would go out at 2 a.m. But it was like six people <laughs> and they would just. They, and so I don't know. I don't, you know, signs. No, but I'm telling you, forget, forget the Trump signs. I'm saying like on the lawn of all the houses, 
there's a lot of Biden signs that never were there before. I mean, houses that you just wouldn't think were Trump, were, were Biden people. My, well, my family said the same thing about Arizona, that their entire block or entire like street is full of Biden signs in a district that was Gabby Gifford's district. So it's always, it was Martha McSally's district. It's always very, it was the more conservative side of Tucson. And the entire street is full of Biden signs and all like Mark Kelly, whatever. And then there's one that has like a, um, a QAnon sign. And one night during the week, <laughs> like Saturday night or something, whatever, they all come out with their pickup trucks and their Trump things and they knock down all the signs. And so they have like a community thing where they're all going to get the signs to replace. Wow. So there's an energy that's like very strange. I, I hear what you're saying, Mindy. Like it's not it's not like the Biden campaign is that exciting. Clearly this is something it's it's an ind- indication that people are excited. I, I'm I'm not well, in the no think- sign camp. I think signs indicate something. All right. Well Look, I ho- I hope I'm right because I've been living here for 32 years, and I have never seen this kind of of um, and like neutral. I mean, I just, I just never saw it like this. Like, it's just like they're scared. Some some of my friends are scared to put Biden signs out on the lawn, but some of them are doing it. And there's wow. houses that I just never thought would ever be Biden signs. Well, so we'll talk after the election. But I think my area is going to go blue and i know that it was it it's a it's one of those areas that they're really focusing on and then the next thing is they're trying to get uh lieberman to jump drop out of the race in georgia because warnick's up at 48 percent so wow i didn't realize he was that uh warnick was good doing 48 percent. appreciate the call mindy yeah. we'll check on all that. right thanks oh. Wait, one more thing what a great strategy though like i at, listen i don't agree with it clearly but uh the philosophy of it but it is a great strategy to have a police sign out there to indicate, like, that it's safe for some folks to come to Biden land. I mean, oh I gosh. wouldn't be surprised if that was a like, an actual like, strategy like, from the campaign to put those signs that together. That is actually is super smart, the idea of, like, um, yes, I agree. I understand what you're saying. People, uh, people understand that, right? I mean, that's like getting in the, that's like the media training that you get, like where it's like, get into the circle of trust. <laughs> I'm just like you and look yeah. at what I'm doing. That's exactly. <laughs> uh, all right. Let's uh, go to some of these IMs here. Do we have any, um, what do we got? Uh, oh my God. Here, uh, let's... <laughs> Here is um, uh, Mike Lee. Oh. Remember Mike Lee? He's the senator from Utah who has mm-hmm. got a real problem with, with democracy. Gets a little rank. Here he is on Fox and Friends responding to Ed Markey, who said originalism. Uh, well, listen to what, uh, what, uh, what, what Ed Markey, or I should say uh, Mike Lee responding to Ed Markey. And also, uh, Senator Markey blasted Barrett's judicial philosophy, saying originalism is just a fancy word for discrimination. You want to take that on? Yes, I absolutely do, Brian. Um, Look, this is patently irresponsible. Of all the irresponsible and inflammatory statements I've heard over the last few weeks, and I've heard some doozies, this might well be the worst. If you think about what he's really saying. Just to be clear, this is the guy who said, like, you know, we don't want democracy to run amok. Right. <laughs> but, but, but to say that um, uh, originalism is uh, discriminatory, I mean, let's be clear. If you're saying that we're going to go by the Constitution as the words meant at that time, we know what the words meant when we said men. We, were, yeah. we meant men. And right. we didn't mean just men. We meant white men. Rich white men. Rich white men, for that matter. Rich men, yes. All right, go back here. Let's do it. Again. Just like him. Yes, I absolutely do, Brian. Um, it, look, this is patently irresponsible. Of all the irresponsible and inflammatory statements I've heard over the last few weeks, and I've heard some doozies, this might well be the worst. Oh my God. If you think about what he's really saying there, <laughs> Senator Markey has essentially said that our Constitution yes. is racist. And an effort to understand it, understand its words at the time they were written, uh, is itself racist and bigoted. 
I can't think of a statement that has a greater tendency to undermine the foundation of our constitutional republic. I hope, expect, and demand that Senator Markey retract his statement. It's irresponsible. He can't defend that. We'll be watching for that, see what happens. Yeah, uh, I don't think that's going to happen. But isn't that amazing how they set that up? They're always trying to put Democrats on defense. And Marky's just, who cares? Why, why should he respond to Mike Lee, who's, who's so, so nervous he has to get it out? Oh, my God. It, it's, it is, such a tool. it's almost like a, it, he sounded like a libertarian caller to this program. To be honest with you. That's what <laughs> yeah. <he said. laughs> Didn't he? Yeah. He just, I thought Ben I, Shapiro. I, 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 can't, I can't believe. You just uh, you just took uh, one of the most uh, anachronistic things you could possibly say. It is the world's worst possible thing you could say. To say that originalism is discrimination, is, I, I just, I'm shocked. With all the things going on, that's the most shocking thing to me. Not the part about the White House saying we're not going to fight the, 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 the pandemic anymore or, or the idea that, like, uh, you know, uh, d- d- Democrats are all sloth or anything like that or whatever it is, whatever obscene, crazy, bat crap, crazy stuff that has come out. It's a critique of originalism. That he, d- he, he doesn't defend the, the Constitution as not being discriminatory or inherently racist and in how it was constructed upon its founding either, does he? No, I don't think you he just understood. can't say the words. Exactly. I, I don't know if you, if, I mean, it would have been great to have him debate a Democrat taking him through like the exercise the log- logical exercise, and I just don't think his brain processed it. Well, yeah, or he just doesn't care. I mean, he he's fundamentally feels. Look, if you subscribe to a libertarian ph- a philosophy, when you start to unwind it, yes, it gets down to a and you know because they're all about their first principles, except their first principles kick in temporarily when people like them or them are in a position of power. That's when history begins. That's when the idea of germinating principles begins. Those principles are derived from a moment where they are in power, and therefore it just coincidentally (laughs) leads to them being in power after that fact. Well, Sam, don't you know, God picked them, and God told them, these are the rules that you have to buy by now. You mean the invisible hand of the market? (laughs) Yes, which is gone. <laughs> um, speaking of Republicans, you know, we had uh, Stuart Stevens on this program who said to me uh, the, the same thing that you hear a lot of the Republicans who uh, are these never Trumpers were part of the uh, Lincoln Project mm-hmm. over and over again. Like, look, I could have made billions of dollars working for Donald Trump. First off, Donald Trump very famously uh, doesn't pay people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He, uh, he gets them to work and then they don't get paid unless, of course, they're working the grift, too, and they get to provide kickbacks. But I'm not so sure that all these people could have gotten jobs with Donald Trump. I'm sorry. I just don't think that's the case. It was like a den of thieves in there. Nevertheless, the idea that they were foregoing a lot of money, mm, I think it's the opposite. I think you form the Lincoln Project as a way of making money when you might not have other avenues available or when you want to maintain your brand and still make money for the future. And there's a lot of revisionist history going on here. Now, I don't know if Anna Navarro is mm. part of part of the Lincoln Project uh, or what, uh, but she certainly has marketed the idea of like becoming a never Trumper. Good. I'm glad people should be never Trumpers. Uh, But that doesn't necessarily mean we should listen to them. Sometimes they forget where they came from, the Anna Navarros. Uh, Here is a tweet of hers. Here's Ben Spielberg found. Uh, Let's do the uh, two tweets from Anna Navarro, 2016 to 2016. uh, Here's 2020. If you're mad at Amy Coney Barrett, who's just rammed through to replace RBG, then you better get off your duff and vote. Elections have consequences. To those who voted for Jill Stein or the pot smoker from New Mexico or wrote in Mickey Mouse, congrats on your new SCOTUS justice. Well, first off, I think there is um, I think there is some modicum of of truth to that. I think there's a lot of people who like would never vote for a a Democrat and uh, whether on the right or the left. And it's sort of harder to say that they were. But if you voted for that, thinking like I'm going to teach them a lesson and it doesn't matter elections don't have consequences well then you know this is what you get you find out 
that uh, elections actually have consequences. Um, and but, okay, well, like I, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole of the third party vote, but it wasn't so much those who voted for third party as it was the folks who didn't show up. It's really just to get off your duff and vote. That well, should be the I mean, comment. It was everybody. Entirely. I mean, it was everybody. I mean, let's be honest. Like it's everybody. It's not just. I'm not saying it's exclusively on them. I mean, it's, frankly, it's on, it's on, you know, I, I take responsibility for it on some level because I just failed to communicate to people how important the Supreme Court is and why that was a sufficient way to vote. I mean, yeah. um, you know, I, this is not a... Well, do you think uh, it's because they always make it about abortion? Like, that was the messaging in 2016. You will lose your right to, to choose, right? I, I think part of it is that the left... Um, you know, uh, didn't just didn't realize the importance of some of its key initiatives were a function of the Supreme Court That's opening right. those doors. And sometimes you are a victim of your own success on some level. Um, and because it's just uh, democratic politics, as it were, and left politics and not oriented towards people understanding that um, it is a little bit elitist and arcane, the, the, the court proceedings, but it's a reality. I mean, it's just real. But let's get back to her indictment. One of the things that I think you got to be careful of in those situations is you need to remember maybe you at times have made a similar mistake. In fact, I voted for Alf Nader in 2000. And now I vote swapped people from New York to Florida. I don't know if that anybody ever did it, but I, I learned my lesson there. And I copped to that lesson that I learned. Did Anna Navarro? Let's look in 2016. I suggest we vote our conscience. If comfortable supporting HRC, do it. If if one of the third party candidates do that, I'm writing in my mom. Oh my God. In Florida. Ooh, ooh. In Florida. <laughs> but look, so she made a little bit of a boo-boo, but uh, getting back to the never Trumpers who make up the Lincoln Project, Axios reports. Uh, that the Lincoln Project is in talks with, oh, the United Talent Agency to help build Lincoln Media. Oh, my God, stop. And is weighing, do you have that? Go from Axios, uh, uh, Brandon. Pull this up. Um, Lincoln's plan is part of the new trend of activists developing massive audiences for political influence. They are able to spin into commercial media success. Uh, they, uh, as a media business, we're printing a pretty big bet on the idea that they know how to get audiences. Uh, says Ra Kumar, a UT agent and just who represents Rick Wilson. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Um, and they've noted the level of outreach UTA has received about Hollywood firms wanting to work with the project has been unprecedented. Oh, Oh, and they have a new campaign ad promoting the music video it made for Demi Lovato's new song, Commander in Chief. What? They are, are you monetizing serious? all of this. That's all of it. This is beyond. Like, we have a I Lincoln mean... Project podcast. Uh, 1.5 million downloads per month. Uh, they have LP TV on YouTube. The company says it has 16 million views. It has a gear store. They have full time, four full time staffers working on its podcast. Well, that should show Donald Trump. <laughs> We put out a podcast. We're serious about this. That's more I than us. All of those Republican voters listening to that podcast. Are you kidding? Yep. There you go, folks. And Anna I Navarro is on the view. For you. Uh, I hope you enjoyed those ads because they were cut and made for you. I hope you found them soothing because the millions of dollars that you contributed to these uh, folks was basically like a GoFundMe to start their media project. That's right. You're an investor now. <laughs> yes. Guaranteed no returns. No returns. I'm, ex- I'm excited for the uh, Lincoln Project uh, Pod Save America War of uh, 2022 during the midterms and how we should be voting for uh, you know austerity. Well, yeah, I think I think it's important to emphasize them as grifters, but I also think it's important to emphasize them as a fifth column that needs to be... Uh, removed from this yes. the left entirely as fast as we can yep yep i agree totally uh let's oh go oh my to, god that's infuriating i know it is i know it is and you know these agencies i remember 
so after the uh, Hillary ran for president, all, a bunch of her key staffers and some of the people from the Clinton Foundation the, the, who raised money there moved over and started, um, not at UT, but at CAA, a foundation. And essentially the foundation, like, sort of, we didn't really understand where what the purpose was, but basically it was a place where you go to all the agents and the talent and you'd find projects, political projects with neoliberals to partner up on. And that's part of the infrastructure. And they would parade like Cory Booker in the office and he'd do fundraisers during lunchtime. But this, that's not a foundation, but this was their purpose. They they wanted to use Hollywood however they could um, to, to, to expand the neoliberal experiment, I guess. Um, Dangerous. Bullprog says, can't wait for the Lincoln blend from Just Coffee and the Lincoln Project Carpenter pencils. <laughs> Yeah. Um, let's go to the phones. Call from a 757 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Uh, is this me? Yep. 757. Who's oh. this? Where are you calling from? Uh, it's Rudy from Virginia Beach. Rudy from Virginia Beach. Yes. So uh, I'm in the military um, 20 years so far. It seems like I can short circuit a lot of these MAGA guys or libertarian guys whenever they're, you know, crushing people's ability to vote. And I just seem to just kind of frame it in guns rights because a lot of these guys, you know, I'm from Arizona, nearly zero gun laws or regulations there. You know, you can easily access a gun almost definitely a lot easier than you can access your vote. And I always try to frame it in those terms like. Why isn't why isn't the Dems like just putting the Republicans on their heels and just framing it in those terms? Like if you can't tolerate a so-called non-citizen voting, which doesn't really happen or matter anyway, because it gets checked and they tally it anyway. Why do you tolerate non-citizens potentially owning firearms? Like, I don't understand that. I mean, you know, I, I, I think sometimes in, in a frame specifically, like you just said, I think there are people who don't want to necessarily leverage um, uh, undocumented uh, immigrants in that way, but relative, you know, like, you know, I don't want to like throw them under the bus because if I'm successful there, they're like, well, we'll just take more rights away from undocumented immigrants. But part of the problem is frankly, and the reality is that, and I don't think that the Supreme court um, properly interpreted the second amendment, but there is no right to vote in the constitution. There is the closest we get is in these amendments that come uh, during reconstruction, which say that your rights cannot be abridged because, because of your race, but they can be abridged in other uh, mechanisms. And it's so uh, to a large extent, it is a, um, it is a function of how, you know, the apparatus that we're going to have to interpret votes. And we can have a statutory, uh, we can have statutory federal right to vote. And I, and I think we're going to see that from the Democrats. Uh, but we'll see how uh, a, a 6-3 Supreme Court uh, deals with that or, or maybe even a 5-4 Supreme Court. But yeah, I mean, I think that is, I think it is helpful to try to appeal to some of these conservatives on democracy terms. But <clears throat> I don't know. You'd have a better sense than I, because I imagine you are. I don't find myself with a majority of conservatives. I would imagine that you do in some instances yeah. or many. I'm surrounded. Right. I'm completely surrounded. <laughs> but um, it seems to like, I, you know, your show, you know, recently I became a member just really in the past year has helped me kind of just process like, you know, there's things that I can intuit. But being able to just kind of put the language to to some of the points that I just intuitively hear, you know, I'm not, you know, obviously, like, there's only so much influence I'm supposed to have ethically with, with the guys that, you know, work under my charge. But, you know, kind of slowly just kind of peeling back the onion and just putting it in terms of warfare or tactics or operational, like, hey, do you think that what the president is doing is the most you know, in terms of soft power, the smartest thing, 
And, you know, a lot of times they agree with you or they agree with my position or some of the guests that you have. And, and they start to turn around and go, you know what, maybe I don't think this is the best guy for the job. And I'm like, yeah, man, I'm not trying to tell you how to think. I'm just trying to tell you that, you know, you have to apply your reasoning, you know, and, and why we put on the uniform. You know, it's for democracy. It's for the Constitution. It's for the country. It's not for team. You know, it's not football. And I think too many times people treat it like football, you know, at all costs. Well, and, you know, trying to break down those barriers, sometimes people get really in their deep, deep holes. And it's like, you know, from libertarian to, the, you know, the conservative bubble in the military is pretty, pretty frightening sometimes. I bet. Well, listen, I appreciate the support from your membership, but I also I really uh, thank you for um, thank you for the call. I admit it's, it's really gratifying to hear that uh, the show is helpful to you in that way. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Is there um, a poll? I, I would really be interested in seeing like a poll on military members' um, political makeup right now. Like not veterans, but current military members. I, I would imagine it's um, it's more favorable to Democrats than it's been in a long time. Yeah, exactly. Um, I've always found it interesting, interesting when military members call into the show and it's their first exposure to socialized programs and it's how they got turned on to things like Medicare for all and what we're preaching at the majority report. Yeah. That it's would be bizarre. a beautiful ad. That would be a beautiful ad. Getting a bunch of, of veterans and military members, you know, supporting Medicare for all, for instance, and and using that angle. I mean, they're, they're you know, the the medical care in the military is um is further from medicare for all for all than 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 the way society is in other words to take society our society from 40 uh from from like basically one quarter one third of our population having medical insurance paid for by the government to the full, to the entire country being uh, serviced by government-run medical insurance is less of a leap, frankly, than going from single-payer health insurance to what the military has, which is a completely government-run, every doctor you see is paid by the U.S. government, or virtually every uh, every doctor you see. And the nurses and the, um, you know, Everybody you see in that hospital, they get a check from the U.S. government, mm-hmm. not from the their hospitals. hospital administrator yeah. who's getting paid from a health insurance company. Right. And that, you know, that's what's. Be real. Someone do that. If, if someone from uh, the nurses union is listening right now, cut that out. Honestly, I mean, it really is. Uh, it is sort of amazing. See, that we if we don't... were like the Lincoln Project, we would just do it ourselves and then make right. a lot of money. And then we'd have like a movie about it and then a podcast and. You know, CAA just... is on the phone. They want me to cut that ad about, um, <laughs> about single-payer health insurance. Yeah. Um, here's Ben Shapiro. <laughs> you, know, um, you know Ben's watchwords is, uh, God give me, uh, grant me the ability to change what I can and accept the things I can't. And when you have a Republican president, there's absolutely nothing you can do about a thousand people a day dying in this country from a pandemic that the government has basically said, we're not uh, really in the business of controlling. Here's Ben Shapiro. It turns out that when it comes to a novel coronavirus, there is not a fantastic way to handle a novel coronavirus that is heavily seeded. If you can get a hold of it before it's heavily seeded, that's one thing. But the fact is this thing was widely seeded in the United States As of February, as studies are now showing, it may have been in the United States as early as early January. And it started to race across the country incredibly fast. And it didn't just start to race across America. It started to race across every Western European and Northern European country. And then the numbers across Europe right now are much worse than the numbers in the United States in terms of the the number of daily infections. You can see the spike. The spike is enormous in Europe right now. Is that Trump's fault? The answer, of course, is no. And what I kept pointing out is that Democrats had no different policy. The only policy the Democrats have brought to bear is lockdown policy. Lockdown pause policy it, is not it, sustainable. Pause it, pause it. I'm sorry. This is such absurd gibberish. The idea, his entire theory that we cannot control this is belied by the fact that if you look at Arizona, how did they drop the huge spike that they were getting? 
People started adopting wearing masks. People started following protocols because they got hit by it hard mm -hmm. because their governor of their state didn't say like, well, I'm not buying any of this. There's nothing we can do. Like, uh, let's say the Dakotas. Right. I mean, in Florida, in Florida, the idea that you cannot control this, that you cannot mitigate it is just absurd. Look at Canada. Mm -hmm. I mean, and also look look to in the in in the EU. Granted, you know France is having a spike again, but the place where the places that really started to surge were exactly the places where they didn't mitigate it in the beginning. That's right, and and these spikes are a function Ask of Boris people Johnson. putting down their their guard, and I suspect they're going to be able to contain them quicker than we are. We're at the beginning of this. Yeah. Let's be clear here. We're at the beginning of of the of the uh, of the the second wave, as it were, and it's going to be bad. Mm -hmm. And the idea that Democrats didn't have any policies, excuse me. The biggest policy you can do is to pay people to stay at home, to make it easier for people to maintain social distance in the context of work or whatever it is. Well, and Democrats with all the flaws to the HEROES Act, five months ago passed it. Exactly. But here he is, uh, Ben Shapiro, with a mix of obtuseness and uh, obsequiousness. Spike, the spike is enormous in Europe right now. Is that Trump's fault? The answer, of course, is no. And what I kept pointing out is that Democrats had no different policy. The only policy the Democrats have brought to bear is lockdown policy. Lockdown policy is not sustainable. At a certain point, you have to let up the lockdown so that people can live their lives. And when that happens, there will be spread. And the only thing that you can do is mitigation. The only thing that you can do is try to protect the vulnerable and protect the elderly, which means social distancing and mask wearing. And that's pretty much it. And if you are elderly and if you feel you have an underlying condition, you need to stay home as much as humanly possible. That's all you can do. There are no, there are no solutions here. There are some therapeutics that are better than they were a few months ago. We know how to treat this thing better in hospitals, a lot better in hospitals than we did back in March. The death rates on COVID are down about 80% in hospitals, and they have been for several months here, which is why you're seeing this massive spike in cases, but not this massive spike in deaths. In the United States, you have this big spike in cases. The number of daily deaths remains around 1,000 a day, which is horrible and which is tragic, but I'm not sure that it's supremely avoidable, given the fact that we do not have a vaccine for this thing, nor do we have a therapeutic that radically reduces the mortality rate of the disease thus far. But that's not just true of the United States. That's true in Europe as well. In other words, what Democrats and the media have been trying to do is create a point of differentiation with regard to Trump's performance. Right, pause that it. does not. OK, we, we get what he's saying here. But what's amazing about this is he's saying, like, if you maintain social distance and mask wearing, then you're doing everything you can do. Donald Trump still still <laughs> mocks Joe Biden for wearing a mask. Oh, no. I'm sorry, like want to talk about the bare minimum of what you can do. Like yeah. the ask for Donald Trump is so low at this point. The idea that somehow like people are expecting Donald Trump to be a magician and they're just trying to create some type of, he's literally mocking Joe Biden for wearing a mask. He's like, like the bare minimum. You could not have a lower bar for a president in terms of like instituting the one thing that, that Ben Shapiro claims you can do, social distance and wear a mask. You could not have a lower minimum of what the presidents do than don't publicly mock people who wear masks, right? Like it's just- Well, also Trump is differentiating himself. If they're saying all the Democrats are doing is trying to, no, 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 Trump, even in his own administration and his own family is the only one not wearing a mask at this point. You just had multiple members, <laughs> multiple members of the office of the man who was literally in charge of the coronavirus task force, right? Like the, Vice President, yeah. the guy who had the supposed portfolio on his desk, it said, fight coronavirus pandemic. Multiple people in his office now have it. Yep. On the lockdown part, though, what I really don't understand, and I guess this is just the Republican model of disaster capitalism in some sense, if we had actually had a universal lockdown 
for 30 days. A real universal lockdown with masks mandatory. You go to the grocery, you got to wear a mask, which we weren't doing in the first lockdown. I do think that we would probably be on the other side of it and everybody would be back to their Without merry business. Doubt. Back Without to your doubt. merry business, your biz, your small business, your little nail salon, whatever it was that, that uh, Ducey and, and we DeSantis We've got to wear masks in those situations. Uh, and, and, but the, after the 30 days, we would have very, very tiny yep. fires. Like you've noticed what happened in New York, right? right? There were spikes largely, not totally, but largely a function of the Hasidic community. Uh, and those spikes came, uh, around Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish holiday. They closed down the specific narrow geographic areas and brought it right back down to where it was over the summer. Mm -hmm. And and like, had we done a major lockdown that was universal, universal, yep. then I think that that we would have had a series of things like that. This area code has to uh, lock down for a week. That area code has to lock down for a week. But, you know, I think we would have we would have the, some measure of mitigation. So if and, they're pro business, if they're so pro business, then well, that's why the thing, too, that? is that like. The reason why we're seeing the failure of these businesses is not because of a lockdown. It is because people are rightly afraid to go out and are weighing and making an assessment. I mean, you know, I can go to a restaurant in New York City. They have 25% capacity in some places. And guess what? I'm not. Because I'm thinking, yeah, it would be nice to have that food sitting in a restaurant and not have to clean up the dishes or but it would also nice not to find like, oh, shoot, I was one of the ones who had it bad and end up in the hospital and, you know, uh, spend a, a month away from my kids and maybe have a debilitating uh, after effects for years or, you know, die. Like, you know what? I'll take that. Um, I'll take that. Uh, that, uh, you know, that. Uh, that uh, that noodle You'll cook soup at home. and I'll eat it at home. <laughs> exactly. I'll eat it at home. Yeah. Case calling from a 971 <laughs> area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hello? Hello? Oh, wow. I got through. You did. Uh, this is uh, this is Cherry. I'm calling from Portland, Oregon. Cherry? Well, welcome to your first call, if you will. Yeah. I feel so honored. Well, I do too, in a way. What's What's yeah. on your mind? Um, I like, uh, I just wanted to call in and, um, just talk a little bit about, um, what has been going on in Portland, Oregon, uh, over the past few months, um, with the George Floyd protests and, um, the BLM movement here, um, on top of going through a, uh, nas national pandemic, um, I'm also experiencing houselessness um, and am queer, um, and I've been homeless for about two years now. Oh, boy. Um, I'm sorry to hear that. Too. Yeah. Um, uh, it's been quite a journey. Um, I have learned a lot, and, the, like, living outside during a pandemic is very uh, scary, uh, to say the least. Yeah. Um and very uncertain even more than usual um but in portland like since the protests started and there was like um a bunch of like property damage and windows broken and and stuff all these businesses um in downtown portland um put up um like wood panels and like boarding on all of their windows um for blocks and blocks um of like downtown portland which is like the center of the city obviously and um that's the area that i typically like um am like i sleep down there most of the time that's where a lot of my like friends and like my street family are um and like this past summer when like they were tear gassing it was in it was very scary and uh like I don't feel like a lot of the media especially like mainstream media of course um really portrayed 
um, what was like happening down here um, and like the experiences that a lot of like people in the city um, like were experiencing um, like the, the protests and the police like were inescapable for a really long time and that's obviously like a really privileged statement for me to say but um, like downtown um it's just they closed during a lot of the protests they closed a huge section of the city for blocks like uh pretty like like huge square miles of the downtown area where there's like huge concentrations of ho houseless people um and that was like a, a pers like a um a, a point um or an experience that i haven't really seen a lot of people in the media really discussing um i like know at all jerry i know the i know the answer to this but was there any form of either uh municipal or non-governmental agencies that were able to provide any support for folks without houses um to an extent um there um at near the beginning of um the protests and when the COVID uh, lockdowns um, were like first, when that was like first starting, like that um, time period, um, there were um, a few like affinity groups and different community organizations that um, were already like before COVID working on like different squatting and squatting projects. Um, and community like mutual aid housing projects like i'm a part of um a anarchist collective and um we are, when the covid shit started happening we lost um our uh building which was a um public retail space um and we just couldn't afford that because we also couldn't be open and one of our main sources of income was having like live music. Mm. Um, and we ended up getting an RV um, to help provide like mutual aid and like mobily um, and help provide like also like um, different educational materials and health supplies and food to other people and help connect different communities with resources like that, like with housing resources that's still work work in, in progress but there there are a lot of um different affinity groups and community like mutual aid groups that have um like formed since the like start of covid and during the protests a lot of a lot of these mutual aid and like uh affinity groups that were working on this stuff a lot of them um like got distracted and a lot of a lot of right. the Work, work that we were doing um, near the beginning of the year just completely went off course. Um, but um, there, there were, there are a couple of um, houseless camps that were set up at the beginning of um, the COVID crisis, like within the first few months that are partial. I'm, I don't, I'm not a hundred percent sure how the funding works, but I'm, um, uh, but they are partially funded by the city of Portland and uh, I'm pretty sure the county. Um, and there are three different houseless camps that were set up um, to help provide socially distanced um, like shelter for mm -hmm. people. Um, it doesn't have covering, um, but there's like electricity and bathrooms and hand washing stations there. Um, and it's all of them from what I've heard from friends of mine that have been staying there. Um, they're very much so community driven. And so the folks that are like living there and are staying there um, are the people that are helping like run safety shifts um, and like volunteering to do that and volunteering to help cook food for everyone else so, and help, you know, that kind of stuff. So um, Cherry, which is really awesome. Yeah, that uh, so I mean, what if I but I hear what you're saying correctly is just that I mean, and, and I would imagine it's uh, a uh, a continuance of 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 an already problematic dynamic is that there's very little attention paid by the media, broadly speaking, and by society writ large to um, 
to the plight of people who are living without houses in, in, in Portland, yeah. but I imagine that's also, you know, uh, the case across the country. Let me ask you this, if you don't mind me asking, uh, how did you come to lose your housing? Um, I came to lose my housing. Um, it was, uh, it's kind of a bit of a story. I, um, I have been, um, like doing like protesting and community organizing in, um, the city, um, for like, since it was like 15. Um, but after Occ I was at Occupy Ice PDX, um, I was one of the founding members of um, that occupation. And um, after that ended, um, me and a group of people um, from that camp, um, we all decided to move in together and have a communal house. Um, long story short, uh, like a friend of ours, or one of our roommates um, passed away um, at the um, beginning of 2019. Um, and I had, during that time period, I had picked up substance abuse um, and was addicted to um, opiates um, and uh, ended up having to move back in with my mom for a period of time um, because uh, I am also uh, disabled. I have epilepsy and um, am in the process of getting my, like trying to apply for disability. Um, and I had to move back in with my mom and I was there for less than two months, um, before, um, there was an incident where one of my, like, there was just this whole, uh, incident that happened and I ended up getting kicked out, um, and was living outside downtown with, um, uh, a couple friends of mine that, uh, I had met at that house, um, and yeah, I started living outside, just doing my own thing. Um, yeah, like pretty much it. Well, um, Cherry, I appreciate your, you know, um, your calling in and, uh, I wish you the, the, the best of luck. Um, you know, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. And like, I've been, I've also like been, uh, I've been poor, like my whole life. Um, like I remember going to school like every single day, uh, pretty much, uh, except at the beginning of the month, like with dirty clothes on. Mm. Um, and so how being houseless is like something that like things could be a lot worse. And I try to focus on like the good things. And I think that that is something that everybody should be doing. Um, but just one more, one thing I wanted to say was uh, during the uh, BLM protests this past summer, there were countless houseless people that were not involved with the protests at all that were just like sleeping nearby the parks, like in parks nearby or in doorways nearby where the protests were happening that kept getting tear gas. Right. Um, oh, man. And were like waking up in tear gas. Oh, and man. the cops, like I saw multiple like like countless times the cops just arrest random houseless people um that were doing literally nothing and just woke up to the cops being everywhere right. and chemical weapons being deployed um cherry just let me ask you this one question if there was i i know there's probably a whole host of things that, that they need to happen uh but what i mean what would be from your perspective like what what would be the thing that that your city or your state or federal government or they could do uh, that would have the most immediate impact. I mean, maybe it's an obvious provide housing, but w w from your perspective, what is it? Well, um, other than like, obviously like um, fucking like give us uh, resources and like money and housing. But one of the biggest things that has been, uh, a huge um, pain in the neck as a houseless person in the city, um, especially like during COVID, during a pandemic, uh, is the fact that the city and the county and the state um, are still sweeping houseless camps. 
and are still kicking like people that are living out of their cars um, out of like areas that are vacant um, and like kicking out squatters that have been squatting like in buildings for months if not years um, and yeah and like just also just don't like continue the um, eviction moratorium um, like because there's a ban on evictions um, right now or I think it's about to expire or right. whatever um, but like also not overloading the system even further with the limited amount of resources that are already available um, and yeah just stop the sweeps and like give people housing and places to take showers and to like take a shit um there are only nine public bathrooms downtown in portland there are only nine public bathrooms and they are not cleaned frequently at all and it this is during a global pandemic that has killed like yeah. millions of people like ridiculous all right terry last question uh is there an agency that you found uh, that has been particularly effective uh non-governmental one or that has been helpful uh, to you um that people maybe if they want to can support um yeah well um there's this organization that receives um like government dollars but they also have um like a lot of they do a lot of community outreach it's called outside in um that's a really good organization that provides a lot of health resources um and medical care to um like low-income folks and um, a lot of houseless people um they they have a needle exchange that um a lot of people use and they just opened one in um clackamas which is um a like suburb here um and um that organization is really good they have a sliding scale for their clinic um and a lot of the folks that work there are really awesome um also um uh there is um a group called free hot soup here in portland that is a community organization and um they like just are people that get together that cook food and have hot meals like serve hot meals to house with people um and that's a really amazing organization here um and yeah i'm trying to think of other ones i could mention but um, i'm kind of spacing well cherry top of my head thanks for calling in hang in there good luck um and uh you know uh, I, I'm sorry you're in this situation and, um, you know, we'll put, uh, we'll put links to those organizations outside in and, um, and free hot soup, uh, on, on our, our page, uh, hang in there, call in again, if you get also, a chance. Also, I'm, uh, I just thought of another organization, you know, um, there's a group called PPOP, um, Portland People's Outreach Project. And they do a lot of various types of mutual aid to houseless people, um, mostly in North Portland. And they also provide, a, like, it's a needle exchange, but they do other, like, outreach and, like, resource shares to um, the community. And they've been going out, like, every week um, out and, like, walking around to help people get, like, um, like safe supplies. Um, to stay safe um, because like also the overdose death rate has gone up um, dramatic like uh, like a lot um, during the um, during this time period Um, so that's also a really good organization to support completely like community led um, and yeah all right well thank you cherry thank you all right cherry hang in there i appreciate the call yeah, of course. Have a good rest of your day, everyone. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Wow. Um, folks, we're not going to have uh, time for any more calls. Apologies. Um, That's just going to get, I mean. It's, the, yeah. It, uh, 
if there's no infrastructure in place and if a city like Portland, which is supposedly progressive, um, they're doing such little. I mean, nine public bathrooms. It's just going to. Yeah. Ugh. It's going to be tougher as it, as it gets cold. Um, we'll put a link to those organizations there. I mean, um, Man. you know. Uh, you know, I, I certainly am guilty of not even contemplating the implications of like uh, ongoing uh, mm-hmm. uh, protests and street fighting with um, houseless communities. Um, and uh, it's, you know, those f- folks are um, consistently overlooked, obviously. Mm-hmm. I mean, like literally and metaphorically uh, in our society because it makes it just a little bit easier for us to go about our day when we don't have to contemplate that there are people who are, for whatever reason, um, have no homes. And that it's very, very difficult to sort of like, it's not even a question of clawing yourself out of there. I mean, like there is a, there is in some ways it's sort of a binary at that point for most people. Like you cannot get a toehold in any respect in society without having, um, a a place to live and yep. some uh leg up you know we're seeing um we're seeing programs around the country that are more like test pilots and they're sadly just uh funded by uh private uh people right. but for with um with payments direct payments there's been a lot of evidence that direct payments um help people in these circumstances that they know what will help them the best. Um, Compton is one of those cities that is doing it. And uh, I think I've talked about that. Maybe we're going to have him on, I think, uh, at one point. Uh, but Hudson, New York, doing a small pilot program hmm. of that. Um, but even then, I mean, look at a city like New York. I mean, you, you know very well. To be able to even rent an apartment, you have to qualify. I mean, like the qualification standards... I don't even think people understand this. We're not talking like, like you good credit. We're talking you have to make forty to sixty times right. the monthly rent to qualify to get an apartment in New York City, and of course people figure out ways and they become roommates and you know there's illegal sublets and all that and that's a big part of, but it is so every step of the way there are are barriers and if you're already without home without a home. You're just, it's, it's almost impossible to get, it's, 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 they say it's incredibly expensive to be poor. It's also extremely uh, difficult. Uh, I mean, that may sound obvious, but it's just sort of like the idea of doing the most basic things that we take for granted. Uh, We're able to do those things because we have a foundation of, of, of existence. We have some of the foundational elements that make everything else that much easier. Right. And stripped of those, and that becomes your primary objective every day. How am I going to go to bed in a place where I am safe and not exposed uh, to the elements or other people or whatever it is? You know, the idea of like whatever, dealing with an addiction or the idea of getting a job or the idea of of, of, of planning long term when, you know, primary objective uh, today make sure that I am not sleeping in an exposed area that I'm able to actually like shut my eyes and wake up in the morning. Um, uh, really difficult. Appreciate the call, uh, cherry. Um, all right, let's go, uh, to the IMs. Then we got to get out of here. It's, uh, it's late. Uh, Oh, you got to do your show. I do, but it's okay. All I have to do is press a button and get, you know, well, it's in three minutes. I know. Takes me a minute to. I don't uh, start it. We have Dorsey's already starting this. Press Canadian. Hey, Sam, thinking about what you said about Sasha Baron Cohen and the clown philosophy reminds me of Peter Cook saying he styled his satire after the fearless political cabarets in Berlin, which did so much to stop the rise of Hitler. Uh, Rabbit from (laughs) Boston. Any news on the MR uh, crew member? Uh, Announcements coming, I think, tomorrow on the new crew member. Huh? Yeah, we got the. Exciting. Exciting. This thing. It's Perry Mason. Uh, Daddy Lennon was wondering if any of you have seen the craziness going on in the L.A. City Council race for CD4. Incumbent David Wright received an endorsement from Hillary Clinton. His opponent, Netha Rahman, is backed by Bernie Sanders. DSA L.A. They had a Zoom debate last week and repeatedly called DSA Rai, uh, Ryu 
uh, called DSA radical extremists. And she asked if, wow. if you would disavow. She refused. Good for her. What an amazing, uh, like, people are paying attention to this. This Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders are, like, in a I fight know. over a city council race in oh L.A. God. It's important, but. James in Jersey City. Sam, Nomi Crew, what do you think about Sarah Nelson for labor secretary? Pretty much the exact opposite of lame, don't uh, kink shame Mitch's hand McConnell. I mean, Love Sarah it. Nelson. Good. I think there's also some other good candidates as well. Uh, she is. She is like in charge. Like we need her in her position because she has real leverage and power, and she's shifting the rest of labor to go in that direction. Yeah. Like I don't want to lose her. The whole thing is like, what do you lose by taking somebody out? It's like when Obama appointed Janet Napolitano, who was governor of, of of Arizona. She's a Democrat. I'm not saying that she was a hero, but like you lost that. Yep. governorship for over a decade. Right. And is there not somebody else who can do that job exactly. where you don't have the net loss? <clears throat> All right. Four more of these so that uh, Nomi can go. <clears throat> Shelby from Phoenix. We need to meet people where they are. We need to build community groups to help rural America. So many people don't vote because nobody has helped these communities since the new deal. There's no easy way to go forward. All that remains a long game. Uh, the Lincoln project is confused like Beto O'Rourke's Senate run. The interest is not in the Lincoln project. It's the pure hatred of the opposition. People didn't love Beto so much as they despised Ted Cruz. Um, yeah. That's right. Jens, do you think they'll have to send out Obama again to persuade everyone to call off the general strike? Yeah, no kidding, right? <laughs> Team BS is my jam. Sam is the crown prince of third wave of right wing talkers in Southeast Northeast Stoughton going to make a cameo on Friday. <sighs> Unlikely. Unlikely. <laughs> Fab you cat. Uh, no brunching when you're unemployed, sick and or homeless. Indeed. And the final I am of the day. Sorry, folks. Sorry, we didn't get to more. If there was a general strike, Biden would shut it down. He would concede before it ever happened. I hope uh, it doesn't. Uh, it's not contingent upon them. Matt, Brendan, know me. Great job today. Know me. Your show starts in one minute. One minute. Check it YouTube out right now. Slash the Nomi Key Show. Go over there now. See you later, folks. <laughs> See you tomorrow. Bye, guys. Thanks. Take a strength that guy to get to where I want. But I know somehow I'm going to get there.